Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we have, uh, it's 9 o'clock, we have a motion that we have to deal with, dealing with the admissibility of various video. Mr. Nelson, I think this is your motion. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, um, last week we did submit uh, the entirety of the body-worn cameras from the three officers involved, excuse me, the four officers involved. At this time I am amending that motion only to include uh, the entirety of Mr. Chauvin's body-worn cameras uh, in connection with this case. Um, as the court is aware, this is a totality of the circumstances analysis based on what a reasonable police officer would have done in similar circumstances. I believe that after the, um, after the, uh, the way the state presented, way the way the state presented it, there was a lot more that happened after that affected certainly uh, Mr. Chauvin's thinking, his process, continues to investigate uh, the original forgery. So it's showing his actions and it's also showing what's happening with the civilians and bystanders at that same time, similar to what was happening at the time they had Mr. Floyd restrained. So I think it uh, ultimately goes to a totality of the circumstances analysis. It shows his reactions, it, you can hear his voice, and I think it ultimately becomes an, an important piece to present to the jury. I believe that with respect to the milestone camera, Your Honor, uh, we're reserving that at this point. Yeah, I've reviewed all the uh, videos that the defense provided as an offer of proof, and I think the milestone parties have to get together and figure out what is already in and what is not before we go any further. Uh, so we'll deal with that perhaps either tomorrow or Wednesday, most likely on Wednesday, because tomorrow we have to deal with the Mr. Hall's uh, invocation of his rights. Um, Mr. Frank, what's the state's response to this motion? Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. I will try to be uh, expedient, but yet I do want to be precise and thorough. Um, we had submitted, as you know, some of uh, Mr. Chauvin's body-worn camera video already. There are really four videos uh, that uh, came from Mr. Chauvin's body-worn camera. Each one is labeled with a distinctive number that I believe represents the time it starts. So the first one we put in uh, was 2011. That is essentially the drive there. We put all of that in. 2017 um, is uh, the next video, and I believe we put all of that in. And 2034, we put in through uh, the timestamp on the video of 203642. So it's my understanding that the defense is asking them to put in the remainder of that video from that point forward. And just to describe a little bit what happens, um, Officer, uh, then Officer King comes out, asks for an envelope. He discusses with Mr. Chauvin some information he learned from somebody in the store, presumably the manager, investigating the bill. He has the bill. Um, and Officer Chauvin at the time confirms that there were goods and services provided. Officer King indicates that's our, that was our guy. Um, that also obviously all presents two levels of hearsay from the store manager um, through that Officer King. Um, they then continue a discussion about the car keys. Um, Officer King talks about getting the security vamp camera videos or noting them, and then there's a short discussion about the vehicle. So in addition to the uh, obvious hearsay problems, I think there's also a relevance problem. The totality of circumstances, of course, is judged by, from the view of a reasonable police officer at the time of the force. This is all subsequent investigation uh, that, of course, could have been done before trying to force Mr. Floyd into the back seat. Um, but it now loses its relevance because it doesn't have any bearing on 
what the officers knew uh, or believed at the time the force was used. So it is all relevant whether Mr. Floyd actually knowingly passed a bill is simply irrelevant to um, the officer's use of force. So that is why we object to the remainder of that video. The fourth uh, video, Your Honor, is 2045. Um, we put in uh, through, um, we put in a short piece of that video. The remainder of that video is a conversation in which Sergeant Kluger talks to um, Wayne and King and Mr. Chauvin um, with a, a brief rundown of what happened. It's Lane and King speaking and uh, Mr. Chauvin standing there not making any uh, corrections or, or additions. And so obviously again a very real hearsay problem um, and not for, you know aware of any um, hearsay exceptions that would allow those statements by the you know, non-testifiers to come in. Uh, also, um, you know, to the extent, Your Honor, that it is admitted, we would argue that it's an adopted admission. So we want to be clear about that on the record. Uh, but there is an obvious hearsay problem there. Um, it's essentially, this court has seen this in its uh, service as a judge, that it's simply trying to get in uh, self-serving hearsay uh, a defense without having to testify. It's very clearly what's um, you know, being attempted here and what's not permitted is to do that through hearsay. So we think that um, is irrelevant as well um, and, uh, and prohibited by the hearsay rule. Let me ask you, on the 2045 uh, video, that discussion is primarily about what happened with Mr. Floyd, the use of force, is that correct? Correct. Is there anything beyond that, really, in that 2045? Or, Mr. Nelson, is there anything on the 2045 tape that, beyond the discussion about what happened as far as use of force? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, there's discussions about who's going to go to the hospital, who's going to stay behind, and things of that nature. All right. But that's correct. All right. As far as the 2034, you put in through 2036 and 42 seconds. Uh, is there anything beyond that on the 2034 video that specifically relates to the use of force or uh, dealing with Mr. Floyd? Not that I recall, Your Honor. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to reserve argument and decision on the milestone camera until later, probably Wednesday since we have another uh, legal issue to deal with tomorrow morning. As far as the 2034 motion, or 2034 video, um, I'm gonna allow that uh, because the defense is not really offering it, the defendant's statements or anybody's statement that, for that matter, for the truth of the matter asserted, therefore it's not hearsay. Uh, it's being offered more to show it is relevant because it shows Mr. Chauvin's demeanor and his actions immediately following Mr. Floyd being removed to the hospital. And I think that is relevant for the jury to see his demeanor and what actions he took afterwards. And so the remainder of the 2034 video will be put in. On the contrary, the 2045 video is, will not be allowed. It is hearsay. I've reviewed it in its entirety. And it does appear that uh, it is primarily uh, of Officers Lane and King giving their side of the story, so to speak. It does not fall into any of the uh, 804 exceptions for an unavailable witness to allow his hearsay. And I do not find that it, it was an adoptive admission by the defendant. Uh, he is there, uh, but mere presence at a hearsay statement does not constitute an ad adoption of what is being said. Accordingly, the 2045 video will uh, not be allowed. Conversation, would those be allowed? Uh, there are matters after the conversation, which specifically, Mr. Nelson. Why don't you go up here so I can, we can go over that. 
Again, specifically, Your Honor, after that commentary, uh, there's additional conversation amongst the officers about who's going where, what, what's happening, who's going to the hospital, who's... Any objection to that, Mr. Frank? Again, it's not really offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It doesn't seem just decisions on why, people, why some people went, why some people did not. All right, we'll allow that. Make sure it's tightly edited so that recollections that are being reported out about what happened with Mr. Floyd are not in there. All right, I think that takes care of that. We have, uh, oh, the jury is here, so I think we can bring them in. Uh, just for the record, the next hearing is going to be on the record uh, with spectators present, but we are going to go off audio and off video, so it will not be broadcast outside this courtroom. For I think, uh, and I'll make a record as to why we're doing that when we bring the jury in.
Good morning, members of the jury. Um, I, you've gotten a handout today. We are going to be doing this hearing entirely off the record, or on the record, but off audio and video. I'm going to ask you several questions, but first of all, I need everybody to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm? That's right, and we'll do that immediately after. All right, we are back on, on the record and on audio and video. The court had uh, just conducted 
a Schwartz hearing with the jurors regarding a matter. Uh, the court makes the finding that there was no juror misconduct and that the jurors were credible in their responses and accordingly uh, no action will be taken. All right, anything, uh, anything else? Oh, we do have, uh, Mr. Nelson, if you could make the record. Now, I will note that you made these objections before uh, Lieutenant Zimmer Zimmerman's uh, testimony and we said you could preserve it with an objection on the record later. Certainly, Your Honor. Uh, yes, Your Honor, just for the record, uh, last Thursday we had a hearing with Sergeant Pluger outside of the presence of the jury for an offer of proof to note an objection as to uh, Sergeant Pluger's assessment of the use of force in this particular case. Uh, I made those Friday morning in chambers during a chambers discussion. I made those same objections um, with reference to the motion in limine that had been filed prior to trial to prevent every single officer from coming in and giving their two cents as to the uh, reasonableness of the use of force. Um, I made those same objections to uh, Lieutenant Zimmerman's testimony uh, and I just wanted the record to be clear that uh, that objection continued for that testimony as well. Uh, given their involvement with the case, Sergeant Pluger and uh, Lieutenant Zimmerman, I did allow the state to elicit, and based on their training and experience, I did allow them for the limited uh, opinion that the amount of restraint was, uh, I think Lieutenant Zimmerman said, uncalled for, but that it was not appropriate. And so I denied the defense motion to suppress those opinions. And I would just only note today, Your Honor, because we have uh, at least three officers that are coming in to testify. Um, I understand that Chief Arredondo will be testifying today and I understand that the court is permitting that per policy and his policy decision makings for employment purposes. However, there are two other officers um, that are in the train. One is the commander, Katie Blackwell, who's in charge or oversees the training. Um, I would note that, again, she has opinions um, as well as uh, Sergeant Kerr Yang, who is in charge of the Crisis Intervention Program. Again, now, I'm running, I'm, I'm concerned that what's going to happen is we're going to, you know, and then we have use of force experts that are coming in. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned that the state is pigeonholing uh, expert testimony in through these officers, where I think that these officers should be say, just allowed to testify, these are our training materials, these are our training policies, these are what we do. So. Okay. And I am allowing uh, the chief's testimony that the use of force was contrary to policy. Uh, it's Lieutenant Blackwell. Uh, that opinion, uh, Inspector Blackwell, uh, I'm allowing that opinion. But why, Kuryang, are we crisis intervention? Are we trying to get in? Mr. Floyd's state of mind through the back door here? No, Your Honor. The, uh, the proffered testimony of, of uh, Sergeant Kerr Yang will just be regarding Minneapolis Police Department's crisis intervention training that they provide to officers. It's a 40-hour scenario-based training course in which uh, paid actors come in and uh, they go through various scenarios such that officers would be able to recognize uh, people who are emotionally um, and behaviorally disturbed um, and, uh, and, and to be able to understand that some people are unable to comply with commands rather than being unwilling to comply with commands. And all goes to the reasonableness of the uh, police officer and the actions that they take. So He's then not, Sergeant Yang is not offering any opinions per se? He is not. He's only going to be describing the training. And you have evidence that Mr. Chauvin took that training? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nelson? Your Honor, um, that, was, that was my understanding of Sergeant Yang's testimony. It was limited to uh, the crisis intervention program and training that, that officers go through. Um, it is within the policy that part of the de-escalation policy and things of that. And, and so what, uh, what it would also include would be what officers are specifically trained to do to identify the difference between someone who is willfully 
resisting or intentionally resisting arrest versus someone who's having an emotional problem. So just so I'm clear, there's not going to be any video shown and Sergeant Yang opining on whether this person was emotionally distressed? That's correct, Your Honor. All right. If it's simply a summary of the training that's provided and that uh, Mr. Chauvin, his personnel record shows that it, he took that training, that's fine. Anything beyond that, including videos or opinions, I'm not going to allow it. And so, Judge, I guess I just want to, I think this touches on something that was technically reserved during motions in limine, was the issue of which training materials would be admitted, because uh, Ms. Blackwell, Inspector Blackwell, uh, Inspector Blackwell, uh, both parties intend to introduce training records that the Minneapolis Police Department uh, has prepared. Both sides have intended to in introduce those. Um, there has not been a kind of a determination, I think, as to does the state or the defense need to specifically prove that Officer Chauvin experienced that direct training, uh, or is this just the general policies and training materials of the Minneapolis Police Department? And that's, that's what we had tried to work out, and, and it's not that we haven't, I just think the conversation got uh, well, on the back burner. Well, I'll just, I'll just give you my thoughts and see if this answers any questions you have about it. My analysis of this is, we have said Mr. Floyd's state of mind is not relevant. It's the defendant's state of mind, his knowledge and his intent. And part of his knowledge is based on training he's received. So a summary of the crisis intervention training he has received is appropriate. We're not getting into, I suppressed the psychiatrist's testimony about what was Mr. Floyd's, was that truly anxiety or whatever. I'm not gonna let a trainer say, look at the video and give those kind of uh, answers. But evidence regarding what Mr. Chauvin knew, what he had been trained on, which goes to intent and knowledge on the May 25th, 2020, are all relevant and would be allowed. So I guess where, what am I missing here, Mr. Nelson, that still needs to be clarified? Well, I, I think we get into some problems is in terms of how a connection between does Mr. Chauvin, had Mr. Chauvin actually gone through this specific PowerPoint presentation, right? So the, the, the way that I, and, and this goes to the how the, the disclosures were initially get, given to me and then how they yeah. were substituted. Well, why don't we just switch places here? Is... Thank you, Your Honor. So it gets into certain issues. So Officer Chauvin, a 19-year veteran with the Minneapolis Police Department, has completed 844 some odd hours of training. As the court is aware from our continuing education, my, I go on uh, the CLE and I report I attended this all day long seminar, but within that all day long seminar, there's five to six, seven different presentations I think that that's ultimately what we see here is we look at Mr. Chauvin's what are called workforce director training records and it says he attended the 2020 uh, use of force phase one defensive tactics presentation. Now what does that consist of uh, is, has been virtually impossible to reconstruct and it goes to primarily how it was originally disclosed to the defense. Um, how it was disclosed from the police department to the BCA, from the BCA to the defense, and from and then that formed the basis of my earlier motion and earlier proceedings to get a copy of that BCA drive. So when I originally received these training materials, for example, these training materials are 20 to 30,000 pages in PDF format, and you can look at some PDF of a PowerPoint presentation and it says use of force academy def you know whatever the the topic is no frame of reference as to when this was given who you know there's no title there's no dates there's no information who taught this course who attended this course um, and some of that information contains very important statements on on part of the on the part of the Minneapolis Police Department when I receive the BCA drive much later and I look at them in their native formats, the reason I wasn't seeing the titles of these presentations or the dates of these presentations 
is because that's how they were saved on the drive. So it would say 2018 phase one defensive tactics, right? So you know that this is now the training material from 2018 uh, from the defensive tactics course, or it will say 2018 crisis intervention training, it, you know, whatever 2018 human factors of force training. So the dates and, and titles of these courses were given on that drive. Now again, you, you can look and you can see in his workforce director training or his workforce director program that he got credits for this eight hour day. But again, which presentations were given on that particular day, you can't, you can't there's literally no way to, to put this together. And I don't think that the state would, uh, would disagree with that. Well, let's see if they do. Mr. Uh, Slisher, what's, can you tie a specific training module to the date that Mr. Chauvin actually uh, attended? Your Honor, what we can do is first show the, uh, the workforce director training, which you know, memorializes what particular trainings, in-service trainings, um, the defendant has attended and the titles of those different trainings. Okay. Then what we can do is have the trainer specifically talk about the materials and curriculum that they've developed for those blocks of training. And for those dates. On, on, on those dates, for, right, for that, so for example, if it's going to be the um, fall in service, there was a PowerPoint presentation that was um, you know, developed from the curriculum from that fall in service. And they can say that that PowerPoint training was in fact uh, presented. And these materials, they get recycled from, from year to year. There's nothing markedly different, uh, in my view, from one to the other. They cover the same generalized concepts. And so, you know, from a foundational standpoint, I think it's pretty clear that the training, the content, uh, was imparted on, you know, in, in this particular class uh, and that the defendant attended that class. Well, it, it seems that a necessary foundation, I think you'd agree, would be this is the training provided on this date that the defendant's records show he attended. Even if it's embedded with eight hours of other training, I think that would make it relevant. If you have training, but you cannot connect it to a training that Mr. Chauvin was at, it's hard to say then that it's, you've laid the foundation for it. But it sounds like you've got the foundation, am I correct? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear, Your Honor. The, now, as far you, as the other issues Mr. Nelson's identified, that seems to be more weight. It goes to weight and you can cross-examine on it and say, this is a you know, three-slide PowerPoint in the midst of eight hours of training on other topics. And that's pure, you know, absolutely fine because it goes to the weight, the evidence, uh, as opposed to its admissibility. All right, Mr. Uh, Nelson, one I, last comment? Yeah, Mr. I guess, Your Honor, I'm not, I'm not objecting to the admissibility of this training. The question becomes, I think, and I don't think that it's as, as easy as, <laughs> as it's presented, um, it's because even some of the things that they've said that they intended to introduce, which are from, that are clearly from the academy, from the, the, the police academy, they're not from in-service records, or the, but it contains the information that may have been a part of some other training. It, it, that's, the, that's where we, so case in point, there's a nerve, uh, there's a PowerPoint presentation from the Minneapolis Police Academy about nerve manipulation and basically joint manipulation, nerve endings, and how to gain compliance through pressing or Pressure depressing points, someone's yeah. nerve. Um, it's clearly a training material from the police academy from 2017 or 2018. Officer Chauvin was not in the police academy in 2018, but ultimately it's part of their training. Now, where did that come from? You know, when was it presented to him? I don't know, uh, and I don't think it could ever, there is no other record of that type of training. So there are training materials, I think there's two levels. If the Minneapolis Police Department comes in and says, we never train our officers to do X, right, and insert X, but there are training materials that contradict that testimony, that undermine that testimony, I'm not questioning the, uh, the 
foundation for these records. These records exist. They all came from the Minneapolis Police Department. But whether or not I need to show that Mr. Chauvin had that specific training, I think is, is one question. Um, well, let me stop you there. It seems like there are two levels here. And, and I'm, perhaps I'm, I think the foundation for any of this training material is at one level, if it's certain training, defendant has been exposed to, he's been part of that training, so he has certain knowledge based on that training, that certainly seems admissible. If it's training that was provided by MPD, but there's no indication Mr. Chauvin took it, or or this is not the version that he was trained on, that does not seem relevant at all. The only way I could see training that he had not attended, which might be relevant, is to impeach, for example, and, and I don't know if this is true or not. I just note that uh, Lieutenant Zimmerman said in his 40 years, roughly on Minneapolis Police Department, he had use of force training every year, he was never trained to do X. And if you have use of force training that impeaches that statement, I think that's appropriate impeachment. And, but aside from that, I don't see why testimony that the defendant has not been a part of should be admissible at all. And that's, a, that's what, that was kind of the concern that I had and had raised in terms of why I thought it was important that each side identify those training materials that needed to be or were intended to be introduced because, again, I do, I agree with the court's analysis. Is it's an impeachment question on one hand. If, the, if uh, as you, you know, Lieutenant Zimmerman says, we were never trained to put our knees on the neck, but there's a Minneapolis Police Department policy that says otherwise, and there's ample training materials that would contradict that statement. That's impeachment of, of testimony um, and certainly should be admissible for those purposes. Now, yeah, had he not said that, for example, I don't think it would be admissible because, again, it's the this is training that the defendant didn't have. And unless you can show he had that training, it's not admissible from either side. And I think that that goes to sort of some of the broad, the problems why I raised you can't have every single officer come right. in and say this was or wasn't a reasonable use of force because the training he had may be different than the training that Zimmerman had. Right. And so we've got so far opinions from Sergeant Pluger and from Lieutenant Zimmerman on use of force. We're going to hear from the commander or the then commander of the training unit about it. Beyond that, I think we have an expert witness from the state and an expert witness from the defense. Is that correct? Uh, two expert witnesses from the state on use of force. All right. We're getting, we are getting to the point of being cumulative. We're not asking every officer because that's cumulative. But also, uh, even having two seems like it might be cumulative, but I'll, I'll deal with that later. Um, it just seems like, I, we, I, we said early on in the motions in limiting, you're not going to be able to ask every officer, what would you have done differently? And we're not going to go through that. You've picked, I've given you pretty good leeway that the sergeant who was involved in the case and the lieutenant who was involved in the case, a lieutenant who's been a peace officer for roughly 40 years, gave his opinion. Now you're going to have the training unit and the two experts. That's it. We're, we're done with it with asking other officers about the use of force. And Sergeant then, Yang, you can ask about what the training is on crisis intervention if the defendant had that training. And what I, what I, so this is where, again, I don't know if the state is intending to call any, so Inspector Blackwell, she's the kind of the, the top dog in the training unit, but then there are the actual use of force instructors, right? It's the people who teach these tra trainings and at least two of whom have been repeatedly interviewed by the state. I don't know if they're intending to call the actual trainers as well, which just puts like, you know, if, if Commander Blackwell, she's not teaching, as far as I can tell, these classes. She's not the one administering them, but she's maintaining the record. She's maintaining the training. She's a foundational witness to get these records in. I would, I would have expected the state to introduce the actual training people, but maybe that's not what they intend to do. Is the state intending on ac asking Inspector Blackwell for an opinion regarding the use of force in this case? 
No, Your Honor. The, the state is going to be calling Inspector Blackwell to describe the training facility, the curriculum, how it's developed, how it's set up, how it's administered. She will uh, offer the opinion, or the I guess it's not an opinion, it's a fact that uh, MPD does not train its officers to place a knee on a subject's neck and restrain them in that position for as long as happened. I mean, she'll do that, but uh, mainly go through the records and describe the curriculum and the facility and the trainers, how it's staffed, and then the individual trainers will impart the, the knowledge from the various disciplines. We have, you know, Carrie Yang, who we mentioned on, on crisis intervention and procedural justice training. We have um, uh, the use of force trainer, um, uh, probably uh, Johnny Mercil. Um, I don't know that I need to have both Mercil and Schoonover testify uh, on the defensive tactics side of it. And then the medical training that the officers receive from uh, Officer McKenzie. Um, and that those are our trainers. And then we'll go into uh, more of a practitioner level expert, um, uh, Jody Steger. Uh, and then at some later time, the academic expert will testify, but not, not immediately. Yeah, my main concern, obviously, the medical training they received. So again, what did Mr. Chauvin know, what it was his training, what was his experience up to that date, all relevant. When we start getting into the opinions, how many use of force opinions do we have? It's cumulative, I think, possibly already. But I think uh, as you go through each of those, it's got to be talking about training that uh, the defendant received, not just here's trainings we had. Because if he didn't take the training, it doesn't go to his uh, intent or knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> understood, Your Honor. The, the, the workforce records specify what you know, right. in-service training um, the defendant has attended. And then we have the curriculum, the materials that were presented you know, during those training blocks. And now, crisis intervention training seems to be relevant to this case. Use of force training is relevant to this case. Medical training is relevant to this case. So all those summaries of the training that the defendant received according to his records and what your, the curriculum is, that's, I think, all admissible. I think when we start getting into opinions about use of force, I think we should visit about that before we start blurting out opinions. We've already had several, and let's, I think we need to go and tread carefully because of whether, they, whether their opinion is something that is the appropriate topic even for expert testimony because some of this stuff uh, is within the jury's knowledge and they should be able to do without an expert. So, but I think let's just kind of go with that and, for Your now. Honor, if I may just, uh, as to the cumulative discussion, just to, right. to add to that, you know, I, you know, foreseeing um, you know, Mr. Nelson being an able defense attorney, I would anticipate if I were to just simply try to prove my case with experts, he would say, you know, the state uh, hired some experts to say this was unreasonable, but what did the people who actually do the work say? Well, right? and, and I so, think we've gotten two of those already. And, so. and, 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 and that's the reason. I'm just, uh, you know, I need to cover the appropriateness of the use of force really from, from every angle to give the full picture of the reasonable officer. I understand at some point uh, enough is enough. Well, let me, let, me, let me be a little more clear. I think you have the right to somebody who's actually done the defensive tactics, use of force training, whatever, to give their opinion about this case. But not everybody, not every trainer. You can take one who's done the training, knows the curriculum that, uh, that Mr. Chauvin actually participated in and say, and give an opinion there. But I think then, then we're done with the MPD people who can give an opinion regarding defensive tactics and use of force. Does that make a little more sense? It, it does, Your Honor. That that was, I think that was my plan. Okay, good. <laughs> Always good to have a plan that's consistent with the court's rulings. And and uh, it, it, and I guess the court will let me know if if you feel I'm I'm. Uh, yeah, let's just go sidebar if we have to in the yes. midst of all this, because as we know, everything is fluid. So, all right, we'll get the jury.
right. Mr. Blackwell. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Council, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the state calls uh, Dr. Bradford Langenfeld, John. You swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Have a seat, please. And before you begin, uh, a couple things. If you feel comfortable taking the mask off, we, we'd prefer you do that, but sure. as a doctor, I can tell you I've had both my shots. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Uh, but we'd like you to state your full name, spelling each of your name. Sure. So, Dr. Bradford Wonkede Langenfeld, B R A D F O R D W A N K H E D E L A N G E N F E L D. Mr. Blackwell. And we can just call you Dr. Langenfeld. That's fine. Dr. Langenfeld, did you provide emergency care uh, to the the body to George Floyd after he was taken to Hennepin County on the evening of May 25th. I did. Just by way of introduction, uh, are you the, the physician who officially pronounced him dead that night? That is correct, yes. Were you one of the physicians who tried to save his life? Sustained. Uh, did you administer care to George Floyd on May 25th, 2020? Yes. What were you trying to do? We were trying to uh, resuscitate Mr. Floyd. To save his life? Correct. So why don't we learn a little bit about your, your background, Dr. Langenfeld. Where are you currently employed? Uh, currently I'm working at Grand Itasca Clinic and Hospital. Um, it's up in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. It's my primary practice. And I also work in Waconia, Minnesota at Ridgeview Medical Center. And Waconia is in Carver County here? That's correct. Grand Rapids is several hours driving away from here. That's correct. Uh, why Grand Rapids? I, I was born there, it's my hometown. It's also the hometown of Judy Garland, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, are you licensed in emergency medicine? I have a Minnesota State Medical License and I practice emergency medicine. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what is emergency medicine as a practice for a doctor? It's a very broad practice, but primarily uh, involves taking care of patients suffering from critical ailments. Oh, sure. Critical ailments such as strokes, heart attacks, car accidents. Um, other emergencies such as that, but also um, less emergent conditions, sore throats, urinary tract infections, things like that. When were you first licensed? Uh, May of 2020. Mm -hmm. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury a little bit about your educational background? So I attended um, medical school at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and then residency training at Hennepin County Medical Center. And when did you finish your residency then? Last summer. Have you ever had any occasion to testify in a court before? No, I have not. This is the first time? That's correct. Let's go to uh, Monday, May 25th, 2020, uh, last year, Memorial Day. Uh, do you recall uh, whether you were working that evening? I was, yes. Uh, where were you? I was in the emergency department. At, uh, at the Hennepin County Medical Center? That's correct. And what was your position or title there? I was uh, one of the senior residents. Um, we're involved with direct patient care, including both critical care and overseeing some of the junior residents. Do you recall what time your shift began and ended? It began at about 1 p.m. that day and ended at approximately 11 p.m. And as, as a senior resident, 
What, what was your role? My role was primarily direct patient care. I work underneath um, attending physicians as a resident. Did you also oversee uh, any other residents? Yes. Which residents would you have overseen? More junior residents earlier in their residency training. Now in terms of any, was, was care administered to George Floyd uh, on May 25th by yourself? Yes. Yeah. Uh, who was the person primarily responsible then for George Floyd's care in the Hennepin County Medical Center Emergency Department? I provided the majority of direct patient care under supervision of Dr. Ashley Strobel, who was my attending physician at the time. Were you the primary decision maker? I was. Were you the person responsible for much of the direct patient care? Yes. When Mr. Floyd's uh, body, when Mr. Floyd was brought in, uh, would you describe it as an emergency situation? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what was his condition in terms of his cardiac condition? He was in cardiac arrest. And does cardiac arrest mean that he had had a heart attack, or what does that mean? Not, not necessarily. Uh, what does cardiac arrest technically mean? Cardiac arrest is defined as sudden cessation of blood flow to all the tissues of the body when the heart stops pumping, uh, typically as evidenced by absence of a carotid pulse. So in, in lay people's terms, uh, if we were to say cardiac arrest means the heart stopped, would that be accurate? That's, yes. What was your, uh, your immediate objective when Mr. Floyd uh, comes in and he's in cardiac arrest? What were you immediately trying to do? Find a way to get the heart to pump on its own again. The primary goal in cases such as this is to achieve ROSC, uh, which means return of spontaneous circulation. And part of that process involves trying to identify the cause of the arrest to see if there's any reversible causes um, and continuing CPR and other life-saving measures. And time is of the essence? Yes. How did you first learn that Mr. Floyd was being transported to the emergency department at Hennepin County Medical Center? I received a, we call it a zip it page. It's basically a EMS notification. Now first tell us what EMS is. Emergency Medical Services. And, uh, and a zip it, is it uh, essentially a text type message or what would you, how would you describe a zip it? Yeah, it's, it's sort of like a, a you know, encrypted text. What, what time did the zip it come in? I don't recall exactly, um, maybe around 8.50 p.m. What information was provided to you for his care and treatment by Zippet? The information was that it was a 30-year-old unidentified male um, who was in cardiac arrest, uh, and um, that's as much as I can recall at this time, yeah. Do you recall whether any information was given to you as to what may have happened uh, to him ahead of time before he got there to explain the cardiac arrest? Not, not at the time, not, not before he got there. Uh, did you know at the time he arrived that the patient was in fact George Floyd? I did not. So you learned that at some point later that it was George Floyd? Yes. Uh, did you um, also know at the time that there was a video or any videos uh, that depicted what had happened to Mr. Floyd before he was transported to the Hennepin County Medical Center on May 25th? No. Grounds? Overruled. You can answer. Were you aware of the existence of any videos as to what may have happened before he arrived at, uh, at Hennepin County Medical Center on May 25th? No. Uh, did you subsequently learn about videos? Yes. Uh, were you able to evaluate uh, your assessments about George Floyd in light of the videos? Yes. Uh, we'll talk about those a little bit later. 
So when you received uh, this Zip It, what did you do in response to it? We prepared a bay in our stabilization room, which is a, essentially a large room with a lot of critical care resources. Um, we sort of prepped a team and got ready to take care of the patient when he arrived. Do you recall roughly what time uh, Mr. Floyd would have arrived in, uh, in, the, in the emergency room? Approximately 8.55 p.m. And when he arrived uh, then, uh, was, had CPR been started? Yes. Um, any mechanical devices or other things being used to help to uh, stabilize it? Yes, there was a Lucas CPR device, which is a, basically a mechanical device that sits across the body with uh, something that almost looks like a plunger and pushes against the chest to provide CPR or chest compressions. So, the, so this Lucas device then was on Mr. Floyd uh, when he arrived in at the hospital. Correct. Uh, did you ever observe at any point in time uh, that his heart was beating on its own? Not to a degree sufficient to sustain life. Do you recall who brought Mr. Floyd into the emergency department? I do, uh, I do recall two paramedics um, and possibly one or two other people, but I don't remember exactly. Do you recall whether there were any police officers there also? I don't personally recall that, no. Did the paramedics uh, who arrived uh, at the emergency department give you a report? They did. Uh, do you recall what they said for purposes of treating Mr. Floyd? I do. Um, the report they gave us is that they were called to a scene of someone who was suffering from a medical emergency. As I recall, and this, this is what I was told at the time, they were initially called for a, a lower type of acuity event of facial trauma, and then that was upgraded to an individual in distress. Uh, they reported that on their arrival, the individual did not have a pulse and CPR was started. Um, they placed an eye gel, which is a supraglottic airway device. It's basically a a super what? Supraglottic device? airway device. It's just a sort of a tube that goes down into the throat and can ventilate the lungs. Um, and then they gave medications, including epinephrine and sodium bicarbonate, um, to try to resuscitate Mr. Floyd as CPR was ongoing. Did they tell you that Mr. Floyd was in police custody? They did mention that he was uh, being detained at the time. Now, did you recognize uh, either one of the paramedics who came in? I did. I, I did recognize both of them. Um, and I worked with one of them several times before. Um, uh, Derek Smith, uh, did you know a Derek Smith? I believe so, yes. And do you recall having worked with a Derek Smith before? I do. Um, how often? Several times um, throughout the course of my training. When, when the paramedics bring a patient in uh, to the emergency department, it, is it standard protocol for them to tell you why they are bringing the patient in? What's the emergency? Yes. Uh, in, in what the paramedics told you when they brought in Mr. Floyd, did they also then give you information uh, when they brought Mr. Floyd in? They did. They essentially gave the report that I just, that I just told you, yes. D did they say to you for purposes of caring or giving treatment to Mr. Floyd that they felt he had uh, suffered a drug overdose? N not in the information they gave, no. Did they tell you in the information they gave uh, that they felt that Mr. Floyd had had a heart attack? No.
Did you receive any information or indication from the paramedics when they brought Mr. Floyd in that anyone had attempted CPR on Mr. Floyd at the scene on May 25th, 2020? Overruled. I did not receive a report that Mr. Floyd had received bystander CPR, no. Did you uh, receive a report that he had received uh, CPR from any of the officers who may have been on the scene on May 25th, 2020? No. Is uh, the administration of CPR uh, right away important for you to know uh, when you're dealing with a patient who has suffered cardiac arrest? Is it important for you to know about that? It is in the sense that it informs the likelihood of survival. And, and what do you mean by that, Dr. Langenfeld? It's well known that any amount of time that a patient spends in cardiac arrest without immediate CPR um, markedly decreases the chance of a good outcome. Uh, approximately 10 to 15 percent decrease in survival uh, for every minute that CPR is not administered. Did the paramedics then tell you anything about the care that they had administered to Mr. Floyd? Yes. Uh, can you tell us what they told you? That they had started CPR and um, placed that airway device and started bagging the patient as in providing breaths and then administering those drugs, yes. And so when you talk about bagging the, the patient, uh, could you describe what that is? Uh, yeah, it's called a BVM or a bag valve mask. Uh, it's essentially a device that's hooked up to oxygen on flow to simulate giving a breath or mouth to mouth as it might be more better understood. But. Yeah. Did the par paramedic start something uh, that's referred to as the ACLS algorithm? Yes. Uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what is the ACLS algorithm? So ACLS stands for Advanced Cardiac Life Support. Um, it's basically a standardized way of taking care of patients in cardiac arrest. And so these are protocols or sort of a checklist process you go through when somebody shows up in cardiac arrest? Correct. It's a little broader than that, but a big part of it is for folks in cardiac arrest, yes. Is, is it to help you to determine why the person might be in cardiac arrest so you know how to treat them? Yes. Uh, have the paramedics tried to resuscitate Mr. Floyd? Yes. Uh, did, do you recall how long? The report received was, we received was the, for approximately 30 minutes. Now you had mentioned uh, to us just a moment ago that they had administered epinephrine and sodium bicarbonate. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what are those administered for? Epinephrine is colloquially known as adrenaline. Um, it's a drug that has been studied extensively and uh, is part of the standard protocol for ACLS. Um, the evidence on it is somewhat controversial, but it is part of the standard protocol. Sodium bicarbonate um, is a medication that uh, may provide some buffering of the acidic environment in the blood that occurs during cardiac arrest, and that is uh, perhaps a more controversial medication than epinephrine. Did the paramedics tell you whether they had checked Mr. Floyd's heart function? Yes. Well, let me ask that a different way. Uh, I want to talk to you about two different kind of heart functions and see if you can describe what they are uh, to the jury and uh, how or if they relate to Mr. Floyd. Uh, the first one we refer to as PEA. Um, do you know what PEA refers to? Yes, so PEA refers to pulseless electrical activity. It's basically a situation where someone is in cardiac arrest, they do not have a pulse, as we
previously discussed and they do have some electrical activity on the monitor um, and that suggests certain underlying causes that are known to be more common. The most common cause of someone being in PEA arrest, uh, the most common causes are hypovolemia either from typically bleeding or from hypoxia or low oxygen. So we'll talk about those in more detail, but was Mr. Floyd in PEA status, pulse pulseless electrical activity, when you saw him on May 25th? He was, yes. And there is uh, another term I'd like to talk about and have you explain to the jury, uh, a systole, I think it's called. Um, am I pronouncing that right, by the way? A systole, yeah. Yes. Would you spell that for ladies and gentlemen of the jury? A-S-Y-S-T-O-L-E. And, and what is that, Dr. Langenfeld? Uh, it's probably best known as flatlining, um, where there's no cardiac activity on the cardiac monitor and the patient is in cardiac arrest. And so was Mr. Floyd in a systole status also when, uh, when his body was brought into Hennepin County Emergency Department on May 25th? Uh, at, at some point, yes, uh, there was report that at some point he was felt to be in a systole prior to arrival. And, and was he, and a systole meaning flatline, was there any point in time uh, during your treatment of care on May 25th that Mr. Floyd was anything other than flatlined during your care and treatment of him? There were times, for the majority of his time in our emergency department, he was in PEA arrest. Uh, ultimately, that did devolve into asystole. Uh, is uh, pulseless, pulseless electrical activity PEA arrest, a systole, are those conditions of the heart where you can simply apply a shock and potentially bring the patient back? No. Um, what are what we refer to as shockable rhythms? Is there such a thing as a shockable rhythm? So typically these are thought of as either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which are basically abnormal rhythms of the heart that are more commonly associated with cardiac arrest, specifically from a heart attack. Um, and they are rhythms that you can administer electricity to and shock a patient back into a normal rhythm. But Mr. Floyd didn't have ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Correct. Uh, because his heart wasn't pumping. Yes, because he didn't, yes. He, in both situations, um, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but yes, he, he was not in V-fib or V-T as we commonly call them. Do you recall, were there still handcuffs on Mr. Floyd when he was brought into the emergency department? I don't specifically recall if they were on when he immediately arrived, but it would be unlikely because he had the Lucas CPR device on and I, I recall his hands being at his sides. Uh, do you recall with his hands at his sides whether there were any indentations or marks on his wrist? At the end of the, the case, yes, after he was declared dead. What did you observe in that regard? What was, I'm sorry, can you? Uh, in terms of uh, any uh, indentations on his wrist or markings on I, his wrist? I inferred that it was from handcuffs. So let's talk about then the, uh, the, the care you then provided once the paramedics have brought Mr. Floyd uh, to the emergency department. Um, what did you do? So immediately on arrival, we took report from the paramedics. Mr. Floyd, as we knew him at the time, only as an un unidentified individual, was transferred over to the bed in the emergency department. Um, as I recall, multiple things typically will happen simultaneously in this in these cases, but we achieved additional uh, access. Um, I placed an intraosseous line in his bone in his leg, 
Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what interosseous It's means? basically a, um, a type of IV um, that goes in, in through the bone and injects fluid or medications directly into the, the bone marrow, essentially. Um, it's a type of access that's easier to achieve than someone who's in cardiac arrest. And did you also go through the advanced cardiac life support protocols? Yes, so simultaneous to that and obtaining uh, blood draw and continuing chest compressions, et cetera, um, it went through various different things that could be causing this. Um, commonly in the ACLS protocol, these are thought of as the H's and T's specifically with regard to the PEAA systole algorithm. Well, let's, uh, if we could take a look at the H's and the T's. Sure. Uh, so, Brett, if you could pull up, uh, I think, 900. I'm showing you what's marked as Exhibit uh, 900 for, for illustrative purposes. Sidebar.
Dr. Langenfeld, um, going back to Exhibit 900, on the uh, H's and the T's, uh, which were uh, part of the, uh, the protocols uh, for advanced cardiac life support. Um, could you uh, briefly explain to the jurors what the H's and T's are? So these are common reversible causes of cardiac arrest in individuals, typically in PEA or asystole cardiac arrest. Um, a lot of these etiologies are perhaps best evaluated through an ultrasound-based approach, but I can go through all of these. So hypovolemia, typically hemorrhage or bleeding, um, so we would think of that more in a traumatic cardiac arrest. Hypoxia, low oxygen, um, again, those being the two most common causes of PEAA systole arrest. Hydrogen ions, um, uh, acidosis can be from any number of causes, but essentially where the pH in the blood gets so low that the heart cannot function. Hypohyperkalemia is low or high potassium, um, it being a very important electrolyte for proper cardiac function and disturbances on the extreme can lead to cardiac arrest. Hypothermia, very cold. Um, toxins, there's a lot of different toxins that can cause cardiac arrest. And that's from poisons to potentially drugs. Correct. Um, tamponade specifically refers to fluid around the heart uh, that can prevent the heart from filling um, and then lead to uh, the heart stopping. Um, tension pneumothorax is air around the lung, between the lung and the chest wall that um, essentially expands to the point where it prevents blood flow from returning to the heart um, and therefore leading to cardiac arrest. Cardiac thrombosis um, specifically can refer to a heart attack um, or a ruptured plaque in one of the coronary arteries of the heart. Um, and then pulmonary thrombosis or pulmonary embolism or is a blood clot in the pulmonary arteries um, that prevents blood from flowing from one side to the other of the heart and therefore leading to the heart no longer functioning. And you, you mentioned ultrasound. Uh, what is the role of ultrasound in studying or trying to assess the cause of cardiac arrest? Ultrasound can be used to evaluate many of these different causes. Um, I think people would be most familiar with ultrasound from you know, movies where they look at the baby uh, using an ultrasound device or a small probe on the abdomen, but it's the same technology. Um, so uh, we can look at uh, the heart directly and see if there's fluid around the heart, for example. Um, we can evaluate for um, a large right ventricle that might be suggestive of a pulmonary thrombosis um, uh, due to increased strain on that side of the heart. Um, we can look for evidence of hemorrhage, hypovolemia, by looking in the abdomen to see if there's any bleeding or bleeding elsewhere. Um, we can look for uh, evidence of tension pneumothorax. For example, we can evaluate for what's called sliding signs um, on both sides of the chest that would suggest that the lungs are up and are um, there's no air between the lung and the chest wall, so we can that use lungs, it to... That the lungs are properly inflated then. Exactly, yep. So we can use it to evaluate for um, a large number of these etiologies. So, so you, you went through the, the protocols of the H's and the T's. Uh, did you have any kind of leading theories for treatment purposes as to what the most likely causes were for Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest? I. I felt that I was able to determine that some etiologies or causes were less likely based on the information that I had both from the paramedics and also the information I was able to obtain from my exam and ultrasound, etc. Um, at the time, based on all the information I had, I thought it was less likely that uh, the patient had suffered from, for example, cardiac tamponade, there was no fluid around the heart tension pneumothorax, um, 
we can discuss that briefly. At one point in the case, I was concerned that he may have developed attention pneumothorax, but I felt it was unlikely we did, in fact, perform bilateral finger thoracostomies where we entered the chest. Um, Let's ask another question. I'll ask another question. Um, you, you were uh, explaining to the, the jury uh, that you thought it was not likely a cardiac uh, uh, tamponade. Then you're explaining why you thought that tension pneumothorax was not likely. Correct. And uh, could you, in, uh, in plain English, help the jurors to understand how you might have eliminated that? We, we essentially um, used a scalpel to cut into the chest um, and create a hole between the chest and the potential space around the lungs. We did not appreciate any large gush of air that might suggest that there was air in that potential space. Um, was, was there anything that you looked at uh, to determine uh, whether or not the cardiac arrest was likely or unlikely to be related to Mr. Floyd having had a heart attack? A lot of that is based on the history that we received from paramedics. There was no report that, for example, the patient complained of chest pain or was clutching his chest at any point um, or having any other symptoms to suggest a heart attack. That information was absent. Um, also, the fact that he was in PEAA systole, as I, as I was told on the initial rhythm check, um, uh, further decreases the likelihood of that possibility. Um, at the time, it was not completely possible to rule that out, but I felt that it was less likely based on the information that was available to us. Did the ultrasound play any role in the question of whether or not he did or, or did not or was likely not to have had a heart attack? No, not especially in this case, no, did not. Did you uh, consider uh, the possibility of toxins, for example, being uh, responsible for Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest, including potentially drugs? In the sense that it might have informed our care, yes. Um, I didn't, there was again no report that this patient had, for example, overdosed on a specific medication such as a calcium channel blocker or any other medication for which there might be a very specific antidote. Um, and so in that sense, I didn't feel that there was a, a specific toxin that we could give a medication for that would readily reverse um, his arrest. And what about then hypoxia? So hypoxia being, again, one of the most common causes of PEAA systole just in general. Um, I did then, as I'd mentioned, uh, use the ultrasound to look in the abdomen and did not see any evidence of hemorrhage. There was no uh, obvious significant external trauma that would have suggested that he suffered um, anything that could produce bleeding sufficient to lead to a cardiac arrest. And so uh, based on the history that was available to me, um, I felt that hypoxia was one of the more likely possibilities. And, and hypoxia as an explanation for his cardiac arrest, meaning uh, oxygen, oxygen insufficiency. Correct. Did you have any other uh, leading theories as to why Mr. Floyd's heart may have stopped uh, other than oxygen deficiency? Yes, um, I also considered uh, an acidosis. Um, in, in particular, uh, excited delirium, which is a controversial diagnosis, but it, it was in the differential in this case. And were you able to make any assessments about uh, so-called excited delirium based on your examination of Mr. Floyd? Again, the patient had been in cardiac arrest for 30 minutes. Um, it, it can be difficult based on the examination. Um, certainly there was no report that the patient was ever 
very sweaty, which is often the case um, when thinking about excited delirium. There was no report that the patient had ever been, uh, that Mr. Floyd had ever been extremely agitated. Um, in my experience, seeing a lot of cases of mental health crises or um, drug use leading to severe agitated states, um, that is almost always reported by paramedics. Um, and so the absence of that information was telling and that I didn't have any reason to believe that that was the case here. So when you, how, how long uh, was Mr. Floyd uh, in your care in the emergency department? Approximately 30 minutes. And at the end of the 30 minutes, uh, did you pronounce him uh, formally uh, dead? Yes. Uh, at the time you pronounced him dead, was he still in some degree uh, in uh, PEA or asystole in terms of describing his heart? I, I think it's probably best to think of these as sort of a spectrum um, where PEA is some degree of electrical activity still running through the heart, but the heart's not pumping. Um, and then eventually that will devolve into a systole where both the heart is not pumping and then the electrical activity stops as well. And so at the end of the case, um, the, Mr. Floyd was still in PEA, but there was virtually no cardiac activity. Um, and, and at that point, in, in the absence of any apparent reversible cause, and because Mr. Floyd had been in arrest for, by this time, 60 minutes. I determined that the likelihood of any meaningful outcome was far below 1% and that we would not be able to resuscitate Mr. Floyd. And so I then pronounced him dead. And, and doctor, uh, was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. And, and doctor, is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia is a commonly understood term. Thank you, Dr. Langenthal. No further questions. Mr. Nelson. Yep. It's nine o'clock, so we're going to take our 20 minute mid morning break. Thank you.
We get our doctor back. We do. Hey, Mr. Blackwell, I forgot to plug in my headset, so it's a Monday. And just a reminder, doctor, you are still under oath. Mr. Nelson. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I have a few follow-up questions for you, kind of picking up right where we left off. You were discussing hypoxia kind of being consistent with asphyxiation, right? Correct. Hypoxia is the lack of oxygen to the brain, correct? Correct. Right. And um, there are many things that cause hypoxia that would still be considered asphyxiation. Agreed? Correct. Drug use. Certain drugs can cause hypoxia. Agreed? Yes. Specifically fentanyl? That's correct. How about methamphetamine? It can. Combination of the two? Yes. All right. Now, you testified about certain um, things that happened during your care of Mr. Floyd. You were running all sorts of different tests. You, were, you used the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, ultrasound. Ultrasound, yep. thank you. Use the ultrasound. You took some blood samples as well. Correct. And you took some blood gas samples as well, correct? Correct, from the, from the blood samples, yes. Right. So can you explain what the blood gas samples are? So the blood gas samples are analyzing different parts of the blood, um, specifically looking at uh, the pH or how acidic or basic the blood is, um, looking at uh, the amount of oxygen in the blood, um, the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of bicarbonate. Okay. And things. Carbon dioxide levels in this case were pretty high, weren't they? Correct. Do you recall what the blood, uh, the carbon dioxide level was in the blood gas sample you initially took? I believe the initial blood gas sample I took was a venous blood gas sample, um, which is less preferable as opposed to an arterial blood gas sample. Um, at the time, I believed it was a venous sample, and I believe the, the CO2 level in that sample was around 100. Okay. A little over 100, perhaps? Yeah. And that indicates an, uh, an exceptionally high carbon dioxide level. Agreed? That, yes. What would the average, if, uh, for a healthy person, well, and you did a blood gas sample, what would you expect the CO2 or carbon dioxide level to be? For a healthy individual without any sort of lung disease, uh, you would expect somewhere between 35 and 45. Okay. And so um, Mr. Floyd's carbon dioxide level was more than two times what you would normally expect? Correct. Now, when you, the reason that you're doing these blood gas samples is in part to help you analyze and figure out courses of care. Agreed? Yes. And that, um, that's the carbon dioxide number that we're talking about is essentially, that would be indicative of a person who is not eliminating the carbon dioxide, right? For it to go that Correct. way? Correct. For it to be high in the blood, that means that they are therefore not eliminating it through ventilation or breathing. And that's a po that points to a possible respiratory problem, right? It can, yes. And that, that increase in a carbon dioxide from a 35 to 45 to over 100, that takes some period of time in order to climb that high. Yes, it, it can happen relatively quickly depending on how severe the ventilation problem is. But, but it generally, it could take 30, 40, even an hour to climb that high. It could take that long. It could take much less time, yes. The use of fentanyl, do you know that to attribute to high carbon dioxide levels? 
it, it can cause high carbon dioxide levels um, because it depresses the ventilation or the breathing. So when someone ingests fentanyl, it, it can cause them to feel very sleepy because of an increased carbon dioxide level, agreed? Correct. And that's one of the reasons ultimately that fentanyl is so dangerous because it suppresses the respiratory system, agreed? The primary reason it is so dangerous, yeah. Now you testified that when the paramedics uh, gave their report to you, uh, they did not give you any reference as to potential drug use, correct? Correct. They did not tell you that they had min administered Narcan or Naloxone during their care, correct? Correct. And during the course of your care of Mr. Floyd, you did not administer Narcan or Naloxone, did you? No. And um, when you talk about those drugs that are immediately able to reverse the effects, uh, that's what that does. Narcan reverses the effects of uh, fentanyl toxicity. Agreed? Correct. When someone has a high carbon dioxide level, um, that causes that person to have a sensation of shortness of breath. Agreed? Yes. And that can happen to a person even without stress complicating their uh, body, right? That respiratory, that feeling of an inability to breathe? Yes. Are, from, are you familiar with um, the impact of um, taking certain narcotics interrectally, rectally? Yes. And that ultimately can provide a more powerful uh, or rapid onset of an impact, right? Yes. Simply because a person has a history of chronic opiate abuse, does that mean that fentanyl can't kill them? No. When someone is hyperventilating, anxious and hyperventilating, they're actually decreasing their CO2 by doing that, correct? Correct. Some of the considerations that you have to take um, also would be uh, the potential occlusion of a coronary artery, right? Yes, in, in cases of cardiac arrest, yes. And someone who has greater than a 75% occlusion of the right coronary artery, that poses a particular risk of fatal ventricular cardiac arrhythmia, does it not? Objection, Your Honor. We approach.
All right, last question's withdrawn. Ask a new question. <clears throat> Only a physician uh, can declare a person dead, correct? Depends where you're practicing. In the state of Minnesota? Yes. A paramedic can't declare a person dead? No, not without consultation with a physician. So just to... Um, based on your treatment, again, of Mr. Floyd. Uh, Mr. Floyd, based on these uh, tests that you did, had an elevated CO2 level, correct? Yes. And um, that CO2 level was exceptional, considered to be exceptionally high, correct? Correct. And you did not, uh, in the course of your uh, consideration, uh, provide not naloxone or Narcan? No. Okay. And it would be, is it fair to say that the administration of Narcan, if you do not have opiates in your system, is a safe procedure? Uh, yes. And if you do have opiates in your system, the administration of Narcan uh, could be life-changing, life-saving? Yes, not in this case. Prior to the, um, but again, the, the paramedics also, based on your information, did not administer Narcan. Correct. Can I make a clarification? I'm good. No, no. There's no question. So you can clarify the directive if they wish. Basic, I'm sorry? I said the state can clarify the directive if they wish. And you would agree that Mr. Floyd arrived at HCMC at approximately 8.53, if we have seen evidence previously? That, that sounds correct. Yep. Okay. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> For starters, Dr. Langenfeld, there is a, an answer you wanted to clarify. Uh, please do so. Only to state that Narcan, administering Narcan um, to someone who potentially suffered a uh, fentanyl overdose, once that individual is in cardiac arrest, the administration of Narcan would provide no benefit. And Mr. Floyd was obviously in cardiac arrest. Correct. Uh, you were asked questions just now about uh, whether fentanyl uh, works by causing someone to feel very sleepy. Remember that discussion? Yes. Did the paramedics tell you that Mr. Floyd was ever asleep or sleepy or anything that sounds like sleep? The report that I received that was that the patient, Mr. Floyd, was unresponsive on their arrival and did not have a pulse. And so there was no report that he had been sleepy or difficult to arouse per se. You asked quite a bit of quest, quite a number of questions about the carbon dioxide content uh, in uh, the blood gases. Um, first off, uh, if a person is suffering from hypoxia, that is oxygen deficiency, uh, is that an explanation uh, for uh, a heightened carbon dioxide content in the blood? It can be in severe cases. In, in this case, uh, do you find that the carbon dioxide reading for Mr. Floyd is really all that significant? I felt that it was weak evidence um, in support of what I was thinking at the time. Um, what's difficult in cases of cardiac arrest is once someone has been in cardiac arrest for an extended period of time, um, the essentially the blood gas that I obtained could be consistent with cardiac arrest from any number of causes. You, you expect the, the pH to be low during cardiac I'll provide a little bit of explanation on that. During cardiac arrest, there's no blood flow to the tissues, therefore there's no oxygen getting to the tissues. 
therefore the cells will die. They'll release hydrogen ions, which lower the pH, creating an acidic environment. Um, they'll release lactate, which complicates that further. Um, because the person's heart has stopped from whatever cause, um, they'll no longer be breathing either. And so you would expect that their, their CO2 um, to be high. Um, again, it can vary a little bit depending on the cause, but um, in my estimation, the, the blood gas in this case wasn't very strong evidence for one cause over another as far as the etiology of the arrest. And, and it was simply consistent with the fact of cardiac arrest? Correct. The fact that the heart had stopped? Correct. And I, I felt that the high CO2 may have suggested a, a respiratory cause. Now, you were asked questions about somebody uh, administering narcotics interrectally. Remember that, that, those questions? Yes. Did you get any indication that Mr. Floyd had administered narcotics interrectally? I had no information to suggest that. Dr. Langenfeld, thank you. Any, anything further? Thank you, doctor. You may step down. Mr. Slisher. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the, the state calls Chief Madeira Arredondo. Before you begin, if you could give us your full name, spelling each of your names. Yes, Your Honor. Madeira Arredondo. First name is spelled M-E-D-A-R-I-A. -A. Last name is A-R-R-A-D-O-N-D-O. -D -O. Mr. Slisher. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, what is your current role? Uh, my current role is Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. How long have you held that position? For approximately three years. And as chief of the Minneapolis Police Department, are you responsible for uh, overseeing the operations of the entire uh, Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, and, I am. And that's the highest ranking uh, role at the uh, Minneapolis Police Department, is that correct? That is correct. Now, sir, I'd like you to first uh, share a little bit about yourself uh, with us. Uh, how old are you? Uh, 54 years old. In what city do you live? Uh, Twin Cities. Um, where are you from originally? Uh, Minneapolis. Where did you go to high school? Um, the Minneapolis Roosevelt High School. All right. And uh, have you ever lived outside of the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis area? I went away for college uh, for a couple of years in Michigan, yes. Where in Michigan did you go? Uh, it was Hancock, Michigan. Which school? Uh, which is now called Finlandia University. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Finlandia University. And what is the highest level of education you've attained? Uh, I received my master's degree. What, do, what degree did you receive uh, in Hancock, uh, Michigan? Uh, that degree was a uh, criminal justice degree. After you completed your college studies, you returned to the Twin Cities area? That is correct. And uh, is that when you first joined the Minneapolis Police Department? Uh, prior to that, I had worked as a community service officer at the uh, 
Minneapolis St. Paul Airport Police Department. And what years did you do that? I believe that was from 1987 to 1989. And then in 1989, did you join the Minneapolis Police Department? I did. In what capacity? Uh, I started my career as a Minneapolis police cadet and then uh, was hired as a Minneapolis police officer that year. And Chief, why did you decide to become a police officer? Um, I've been very fortunate to uh, come from a city a very uh, resilient, very welcoming, um, uh, proud, proud people here in the city of Minneapolis. And uh, my uh, dear parents uh, taught all of my siblings and me uh, about the, the, the service of love. And so I've been very fortunate to then eventually uh, join the Minneapolis Police Department and give back to the very community, the very city uh, that embraced me and has been so good to me. You're familiar the, the, uh, with the motto of the Minneapolis Police Department? Yes, I am. What is it? And that is to protect with courage and to serve with compassion. And what does that motto mean? Um, we are oftentimes the first face of government that our communities will see. And uh, we will oftentimes meet them at their worst moments. And so um, the badge that I wear and that members of uh, the Minneapolis Police Department where it means a lot uh, because the first time that we interact with our community members may be the only time that they have an interaction and so that has to count for something and so um, so it's very important for us to make sure that we're uh, meeting our community in that space uh, treating them with dignity uh, being their guardians and in representing um, and all of the, 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 uh, the men and women that came before us who served so proudly on this department. And sometimes you have to protect with, with courage and you have to use force, is that correct? At times, yes. Uh, as a police officer, uh, you will have to use force. Uh, sometimes serving with compassion means to understand when force is not required. What does it mean to then serve with compassion? Uh, to, to serve with compassion uh, to me means to uh, understand and authentically accept that um, we see our neighbor as ourselves. We, we, uh, we value one another. We see our community as necessary um, um, for our existence. And so that's what serving with compassion means to me. Now you've told us a little bit about your educational background. I'd like you to um, share with all of us a little bit more about your specific law enforcement training. Uh, you mentioned the academy. Is that where you received your law enforcement specific training? Yes, it is. Uh, please describe how that training occurred. Uh, I was a um, member of the first Minneapolis police cadet program and uh, along with many other candidates we received training both uh, academic training on uh, the laws um, of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we received training as it relates to uh, everything from um, uh, driving and defensive tactics, um, uh, community relations. Um, and so uh, we also, there's post requirements of Minnesota post officer standards and training to receive our license. Uh, there was a test that we had to take then. Um, there was also scenario-based training as well um, uh, to grade and assess how we uh, performed um, during that training in the academy. Um, and so that was, that was part of that, that important training that I received along with my candidates at the, uh, at the academy. And that was the, that was the very first Minneapolis Police Academy? That is correct. And a trainee at the academy is a, a, that trainee referred to as a cadet? That is correct. Uh, at your employment, you've been continuously employed uh, as a Minneapolis, in the Minneapolis Police Department since, was that 1989? That is correct, sir. Uh, has the academy changed uh, since you first uh, were a cadet back in 1989? It has. And, and while I certainly believe that at the time back in 1989 that training was important. Um, like any police department, uh, 
we should not be monolithic. Our communities are not monolithic. Our, our training should evolve. Uh, we should be focused on what are national best practices. And so uh, the training that our uh, recruits and cadets get today, um, and rightfully so, is far better uh, than the training that uh, I received uh, those years ago. Well, we'll circle back to that a little bit later. Uh, you also mentioned that you take post credits, is that right? Yes, that is correct. And POST stands for Peace Officer Standards and Training? That is correct. What is the requirement for um, POST training? How many, how many courses are you required to take in a given period? Yeah, every sworn uh, peace officer in the state of Minnesota um, receives their license through the uh, POST, or Peace Officer Standards and Training uh, Board. And so, uh, Post will will change up what some of those requirements are from time to time, uh, but uh, some of the ones that I think of right now would be uh, uh, crisis intervention training. Um, um, there's certainly uh, defensive tactics training. There's there's uh, um, now a form of procedural justice training that is required, and so um, Minneapolis police officers receive that mandated training. But we're also very fortunate that. Um, we're able to receive additional training above and beyond what is required of the uh, post board. And you personally participate in this training in order to maintain your post license? That is correct. Uh, Chief, you uh, began your career in 1989. You're now the chief of the police department. Fair to say you've had many roles within that department. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, at this time, I'd like to publish Exhibit 209, if I may. And uh, we'll leave that up, uh, if we may, while you testify, if, what was the first position you held within the department after you completed your academy training? Um, I was uh, sworn in as a Minneapolis police officer. Now, we've heard that term sworn officer uh, before. Can you please explain to the jury what that, what that means? Uh, sworn officer, um, after you complete the required educational uh, requirements and certainly after you complete your uh, performance measures at the academy, uh, then you are uh, eventually sworn in at a location and uh, um, traditionally our city clerk has been there and you take an oath and uh, you're, you're, you're sworn in as an official uh, member of the Minneapolis Police Department but also as a city of Minneapolis employee and you start your employment with the city then. And what were your duties then as a sworn police officer that rank for the city of Minneapolis? Uh, primary duties was to be a 911 responder, uh, to work in a geographical area of the city of Minneapolis in a district uh, at a precinct and uh, respond to 911 calls on a given shift. Are those also called uh, calls for service? That is correct. And as a, uh, as a patrol officer at that time, well, how long did you remain a patrol officer? Approximately five years or so. And can you tell the jury what geographic district you served as a patrol officer? Yes, I, I served uh, for a short time in the third precinct, and then um, I think the bulk of that time uh, in the Minneapolis fourth precinct, which is located in North Minneapolis. Now, during uh, that time period, that five years as a patrol officer, did you ever have occasion to arrest a suspect? Yes, I did. Um, how about a non-compliant suspect? Yes. You've had to place handcuffs on someone who was not compliant? That is correct, yes. Approximately, would you care to guess how many times? Um, I'm, I'm sure several. Okay. I'm sure several. Uh, this is something that's uh, fairly regularly, a fairly regular occurrence uh, as a police officer, as a patrol officer, is that right? That is correct. You've had to be in situations where you've had to use force, is that right? That is correct. Have you also been in situations where you've had to de-escalate or talk someone into compliance? Yes. And is that a regular part of your job as a patrol officer? Yes, it is. Even in from 1989 to approximately 19, or I'm sorry, uh, 1994? Yes. 
Then after serving this period of time as a patrol officer, what was your next position at MPD? Um, and I believe in 1997, I was then promoted to the rank of uh, sergeant in the Minneapolis Police Department. And what do you have to do to be promoted to the rank of sergeant? What are the requirements? Um, it is a uh, civil service test uh, that you take, um, and um, you have to successfully pass that and receive a grade from that. And um, I'm trying to recall if there was an assessment center that was also part of that testing process. Um, but uh, there is a number of years that you have to at least have served as a police officer before you can take uh, the sergeant's uh, uh, test and promotion. And what is the role of a sergeant in the Minneapolis Police Department? Uh, sergeant's role, uh, and I've often said it is the most influential role in the police department. How so? Um, it's, it's most influential because you have the most proximity uh, to the men and women who are out there serving in the community. Um, you're there for them at the roll calls. You are a mentor. You uh, give them guidance. Um, they are going to see you far often than they would ever see the chief of police, for example. Um, and you set the tone in the attitude. And so, um, um, so that, that's really uh, a, a very significant role within the Minneapolis Police Department. That's uh, a first line supervisory position, correct? Yes, it is. And uh, sergeants or people with that rank within MPD would serve in a variety of jobs or functions, is that correct? That is correct. And how did you serve as a, as a sergeant when you were first promoted? Uh, I served as an uh, investigator uh, with a, the property crimes unit at that time. Okay. Uh, how many people approximately did you supervise? At that time, I did not supervise any. I worked as a, um, a detective or investigator mm -hmm. alongside other detectives. Okay. Uh, how long did you hold that position? Uh, approximately two years. And after that? Uh, then I served as a sergeant in our Minneapolis Police Department Internal Affairs Unit. Describe what a sergeant in internal affairs does. Um, sergeant internal affairs um, is uh, responsible for investigating uh, cases of misconduct involving um, uh, Minneapolis Police Department employees and uh, fact-finding, uh, preparing reports, and ultimately uh, submitting those to their supervisor. Can uh, those investigations include uh, inappropriate uses of force or excessive force? Yes, they can. And have you ever evaluated an, an excessive force case uh, in internal affairs context? I believe I have, yes. How long did you serve as a sergeant in internal affairs? Um, I served in that position about two years as well. Uh, and then what did you do? Uh, then I was uh, promoted to the rank of lieutenant. Now, uh, what was required of you to promote to lieutenant? That also required taking a civil service uh, exam and I, I believe certainly at that time an assessment, going through an assessment center, which comprised of uh, scenarios and different type of performance measures uh, for that position. Is it true that a lieutenant is just a, it's a higher level of management above the first line sergeants? Yes, our lieutenants are considered managers within the organization. Okay. And what were your duties then as a lieutenant? Um, I, I served uh, for a time as um, overseeing the, at that time, uh, the federal mediation agreement uh, that the Minneapolis Police Department had entered into with the uh, Unity Community uh, Mediation Team. And I also uh, served time as a uh, fourth precinct lieutenant on the night shift. Okay. And what is the, what is lieutenant uh, in the fourth precinct night shift, what do you do? Uh, you are you have a, a team of, of sergeants and a, a team of officers on a shift uh, that particular shift work the night hours in North Minneapolis and uh, really there is a lieutenant there to support the, uh, the the mission of the precinct inspector who is kind of like uh, the, the chief of that precinct um, but also then to support your your officers uh, on the shift as well yes
And how long did you hold that position? Uh, that was probably about two years as well. Seeing a pattern here. What, what yes. happened after that? Um, after that, I was um, appointed to the rank of commander. And what does a commander do? Uh, commander, commander now, unlike the previous civil service uh, positions, a commander now is appointed specifically by the chief of police. And it is a higher position and um, uh, the commander is usually in charge of a division. And so at that time I was appointed to commander of the internal affairs uh, division. And so you're now back to internal affairs, but, but more or less overseeing the entire operation? That is correct. And how long did you hold that position? About two years. Okay. Yeah. Um, and after that? Uh, then I was appointed as uh, the first precinct inspector. And so that was a position uh, uh, in charge of the downtown precinct or first precinct. And uh, that was a patrol function, so that was mainly... Uh, patrol related functions even though we do uh, have um, uh, great civilian teams who work on things such as crime prevention and and others but I was appointed to first precinct inspector and what does the inspector do at that level uh, the inspector at that level is really driving uh, the work of the precinct uh, monitoring and working on uh, trying to reduce crime in that precinct working with its stakeholders its neighborhood associations, its business community, um, uh, making sure that um, whether it's investigative or patrol in the precinct that they have the resources and uh, things that they need, um, uh, interfacing with the uh, city council members of that particular ward. Um, and so that is really a lot of the, the work that a precinct inspector does. And does, and does the precinct inspector then supervise either? you know, uh, maybe not at the ground level, but is responsible for the supervision of all of the different positions uh, underneath the inspector? That is correct. All right. And how long were you in that position? About two years. Yes. Okay. And uh, after that? Uh, then I was uh, appointed uh, to be deputy chief, the chief of staff. And what does a deputy chief do? Um, Deputy Chief at that time was a unique role in that um, I was really Chief of Staff for uh, the Chief of Police, a lot of, a lot of work um, helping to support our department initiatives, uh, reaching out to elected officials, community stakeholders, um, uh, boosting up um, programs, uh, grants that the department had received. Um, and, and, and really carrying out the mission of the Chief of Police. And uh, from there? After about two years, I was appointed to um, um, Assistant Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. And by whom were you appointed? Uh, then it was uh, former Chief Janae Harteau. Okay. And what did you do as the Assistant Chief? Um, that was really overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the Minneapolis Police Department and again also supporting the Chief. And for approximately how long? Uh, that may have been a little shorter, about a year or so, I think. Okay. You've, yeah. you've broken the pattern. Yes. Right? yes. And, and now, of course, you're the, uh, the chief of police. Uh, how are you selected, or who selected you to be the chief of police? Well, I served uh, in an acting or an interim capacity, then under uh, Mayor Betsy Hodges, and, um, and then after that term ended, um, then Mayor Fry of the City of Minneapolis uh, appointed me as Chief of Police. Um, you may take that exhibit down. So you've uh, had certainly, it seems, uh, every rank uh, available within the Minneapolis Police Department and a variety of roles, is that right? That is correct. And as such, are you familiar generally with the day-to-day -day operations, uh, I guess from the patrol level all the way up to the level you are now? That is correct. Uh, what I'd like you to do at this time is, uh, is provide us with a little bit more information, sort of an overview of the Minneapolis Police Department and how it serves the city of Minneapolis. Um, MPD's jurisdiction is within the geographic uh, limits of Minneapolis, is that right? 
Yes. And what's the what's the approximate geographic area that you're that you have jurisdiction over? Well, uh, to the north, we border uh, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center. Uh, to the south of Richfield, um, uh, to our east, just right up against uh, the River St. Paul, um, and to the west, Golden Valley. And so it's a pretty large area. Would you agree that's about 58 square miles, give or take? Yes. Uh, and are you aware of the current population of Minneapolis? Uh, roughly about 420, 30,000. Uh, how many sworn officers work for the Minneapolis Police Department? Currently, uh, around 700. And as the chief, are you generally familiar with the officers who work for you? It's a lot of people. Um, it's a lot of people, um, and so it it it, uh, it can. It can be taxing to try to. We've, you know, we've got a lot of people that work in different areas, but, uh, um, but I have a pretty good understanding of where folks are throughout the organization. Yes. As we go on, I'll be asking you if you recognize some of the names of different people we may have met to this point. But at this time, uh, up until May 26, 2020, an individual named Derek Chauvin was a Minneapolis police officer. Is that right? That is correct. And are you aware of who this person is? I am. Do you recognize this person in the courtroom today? I do. Would you please point to him and describe what he's wearing? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Chauvin's right there. Uh, he appears to be wearing a uh, navy blue suit uh, with a light blue tie and white shirt. Thank you, Your Honor. May the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant? Any objection? You're welcome. So I'd like you to please uh, describe for the jury how MPD is structured to deploy law enforcement services to about 420,000 people over a 58 square mile area uh, 24 hours a day every day. Uh, administratively, how is the department organized? Uh, it, administratively, we are broken down into bureaus. And so, uh, as I may have mentioned, you have the chief of police that uh, really leads the organization and its mission and vision and goals. And then we have an assistant chief that oversees the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, after that, there are three deputy chiefs. And uh, we have a deputy chief of patrol. Um, and uh, the deputy chief of patrol is responsible for the five geographical precincts uh, throughout the city of Minneapolis. Um, we also have a deputy chief of professional standards and that deputy chief oversees really two main functions and that is our training for our entire department as well as um, uh, the internal affairs uh, portion of our department. Um, and then we have a deputy chief, the third one, of investigations. So all of the uh, uh, employees who work, whether it's homicide unit, robbery, assault, um, that deputy chief oversees uh, the investigations bureau. And um, we also have commanders who oversee these divisions. I, as I mentioned, they're above the civil service rank, they're appointed, um, and they serve in different uh, divisions. Uh, and the precincts, as I mentioned, there's five geographical areas. We have five precinct inspectors, and uh, they are like the chiefs of police uh, for those precincts, yes. And, and so it, by my count, there were three bureaus. You have investigations, patrol, and professional standards. Is that right? That is correct. And the investigations bureau has a number of individual units within the bureau, correct? That is correct. For example, what, what type of units are within investigations? Yeah, investigations bureau um, has homicide, assault, robbery, um, crimes against children. Uh, there are several, several different uh, investigative Units. So within the investigative bureau, you mentioned homicide. That's where Lieutenant Zimmerman would work. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And the patrol bureau uh, that provides services such as a uh, 911 response, like you did when you were a patrol officer. Is that right? That's correct. Crime prevention, traffic control, emergency services, all within the uh, patrol bureau. Yes. And uh, in, in individuals. Sorry. 
and uh, within the patrol bureau in order to provide those patrol services over the geographic area we've heard about um, precincts is that right yes and if we could publish exhibit 269 Looking at uh, exhibits 269, is this the, the geographic area of uh, your jurisdiction? Yes, it is. And then can you just use 269 to describe the precincts and what they are and what purpose they, they serve? Yes, uh, this exhibit uh, outlines the five geographical precincts. Um, and this also uh, lets our community know which precinct, uh, based on where they happen to live, which precinct uh, their residence or business is a part of. And so um, you're able to see from this map here, uh, Sector 1 or Precinct 1 kind of is in the center there, covers downtown Cedar Riverside area. Uh, the sector, uh, excuse me, uh, the number 4 at the uh, top left-hand corner would be our uh, North Minneapolis precinct. Um, and then second precinct, number 2, it covers southeast, northeast Minneapolis, and then uh, fifth precinct covers southwest Minneapolis near the lakes area and then the third precinct uh, covers our southeast Minneapolis area and focusing uh, specifically on the third precinct uh, I see it's divided further into these sectors is that right that is correct and that's for the purposes of being able to uh, deploy patrol services correct yes right. within the the various precincts this is primary uh, uh, a tool for dispersing uh, patrol officers, correct? Yes. Uh, but there are also uh, investigative functions within the precincts as well, correct? Yes. That would be specifically assigned to that precinct? Yes. Okay. But professional standards, that would that would cover all of the precincts. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, if we could publish 268, I'd like to focus specifically on the third precinct. Well, it's a little hard to see, uh, but y you can see the, um, yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Uh, you can see the different uh, colors. Uh, it, it appears the sectors that we looked at um, in, the, in the previous exhibit are listed here. Uh, and if you take a look at sector one, that would be represented as uh, 310 on the exhibit 268. Is that right? Yes. And then sector two would be exhibit 320? Yes. All right. And we won't go through uh, each of the sectors, but uh, the purpose of these uh, sectors, again, is to uh, further distinguish different geographic areas within the third precinct or any precinct so we'd be able to have, say, dispatchers deploy law enforcement resources there. Is that right? That is correct. Dispatchers like Jenna Scurry, for example, could send a car to a particular location based on the different sectors that are within this precinct map. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And a Professional Standards Bureau, uh, you can take that down, please. The Professional Standards Bureau, what does a Professional Standards Bureau do? One of the functions is training. Uh, we have a commander, again, that is one of the appointed ranks, who oversees the training division, and uh, they're responsible for making sure that not only are our officers um, uh, in compliance with our mandated post board educational requirements every year, but also really looking to make sure that we continue to evolve and that we're uh, staying on top of necessary training that's important for us that um, has a benefit to our communities that we serve. Um, and so that's, that's a core piece to what our professional standards training division does. And so within uh, professional standards, you have the training services and that's staffed at the, I guess it's at the commander level, led at the commander level. That is correct. And who is the current commander of uh, the training division? Uh, the current commander for the Minneapolis training division is Commander Darcy Horn. Last year, who was your commander? Uh, last year, it is it, she is now Inspector Katie Blackwell, but she was Commander Katie Blackwell uh, last year when she led our training. And she would have been uh, the training commander on May 25, 2020. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. 
There's other divisions within uh, professional standards. I think you mentioned internal affairs, um, but there's also an administrative services division. Is that right? Yes. And what does the administrative services division do? Uh, administrative services division um, can deal with everything from, from grants, uh, different types of programs that the city of Minneapolis is embarking upon, um, um, employee personnel matters as well. Also, um, you know, business software and equipment. Technology, business software, yes. Body cameras, milestone cameras. And, yes. And we met Jeff Rugel, and that's where he works, is that right? Yes, Lieutenant Rugel is part of that, yes. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Minneapolis Police Department and reacting to calls for service. Um, the role of the Minneapolis Police Department is generally to, to serve the community's law enforcement needs. Is that right? That's correct. And most requests for service come in through uh, the 911 system. Is that right? Yes. And you respond or officers respond to uh, different calls for service. Um, could you please describe the types of calls for service uh, Minneapolis Police Department commonly responds to? Um, calls for service can absolutely range from everything from uh, tenant trouble to a loud party dispute to domestic assault uh, to shooting and to even homicide. So it can, it can really range from a, a wide variety of types of calls. People will call to report a crime and request assistance, is that yes. right? People also uh, call to report you know, general emergencies. Yes, they can. What type of emergencies? Uh, medical emergencies, um, they can uh, request calls for service for that. Um, uh, oftentimes we have community who are calling because uh, it may be 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, they don't know of any other service or who will respond, but they will call us for, for those types of situations as well. And I suppose what constitutes an emergency is in the eye of the caller somewhat? That's correct, yes. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, MPD responds. Yes. Do you know uh, approximately how many calls for service the Minneapolis Police Department receives annually? It's usually a couple of hundred thousand, and, and then we also have officers that we um, categorize as um, self-initiated activity. So that could mean an officer happens to be driving through a neighborhood and see something and reports out on their radio that they're going to, to look into it. So, uh, so it's a combination, but it's a... It's a lot of calls. And generally people don't call the police department to say, hey, everything's going great. Just wanted you to know they have something that they want uh, you to do. Exactly, yes. Uh, it sounds then like it's fair to say there's more to policing than just going out and arresting people. You provide a, a broad spectrum of, uh, of policing services to the community. Yeah, I, I would actually say that um, the actual law enforcement part is, is probably pretty small compared to most of the types of uh, calls our officers are being called to address and deal with. Yeah. So we've touched on uh, police training, your own personal police training, and um, how police training is dispensed, I guess, through the Professional Standards uh, Bureau. I'd like you to describe that a little bit further. Are you, are you generally familiar with the types of training that the Minneapolis Police Department provides its officers? Yes, I am. Where does this training take place? Um, we have a uh, large facility uh, located in North Minneapolis, which we call our uh, Special Operations Center. And um, that is where the, the vast majority of our required training takes place. Is the Special Operations Center then a dedicated building uh, only for training purposes? Um, it's, it's primarily dedicated for training purposes, yes. And I think you testified it's supervised uh, by a commander. Uh, I'd like you to tell the jury a little bit about when now, uh, currently, training begins for a Minneapolis police officer who's hired on to the department. Uh, for a new officer who's hired on to the department, that first initial orientation to our training begins at the academy. And uh, that, again, is overseen by uh, the commander of the training unit. And um, it, um, we, we actually have a class currently in place now at the uh, 
um, academy at the SOC. And so uh, that first initial indoctrination to our academy occurs um, during that first part of the training at the academy. Fair to say that the training that's provided to Minneapolis police officers is uh, can be generally divided into two categories, pre-service training and post-service training. Is that right? Yes. And the pre-service training would include the academy that you just uh, talked about. Is that right? That is correct. And then post-service training is the continuing education uh, that you testified about previously. Is that right? Yes. So let's again focus on the academy training. Uh, how many cadets do you generally have at a given time per class? Well, we um, it's usually been a mixture of, of recruit classes and a cadet class. Um, I would say that we average in terms of recruit class um, numbers around 30. Uh, cadets might be 20 to 25. So now I'm going to ask you to just just define some terms a little and explain to the jury the difference between a recruit and a cadet. Um, uh, recruits are typically individuals who've already been focused, laser focused on a career. Uh, being a Minneapolis police officer is what I wanted to do. They typically have already at least their two-year uh, criminal justice or law enforcement degree. Um, uh, most have completed their required skills training. Um, cadet was um, was really created to capture diversity um, of candidates. And so the cadet might have individuals who may have had a um, psych, uh, psychology degree, uh, but it's really streamlining them in. It's a little lengthier um, process, but it's really getting them on board so that they meet uh, the state requirements, uh, the post requirements to get to be hired. And so, uh, the cadet program was a, is a wonderful way for us to capture uh, diversity within our police department. And so, uh, but they both, once their programs are finished, their both classes, whether you're a recruit or a cadet, you are ready to successfully become a Minneapolis police officer. Do you also take lateral candidates? Yes, lateral candidates. We, we certainly have had uh, hirings of laterals in the years past, yes. And do those individuals also go through a similar training as a recruit? Uh, yes, the laterals can. It's usually much smaller in length of time just because laterals are uh, individuals who've already served as police officers perhaps in another jurisdiction or another part of the state or out of state actually. We'll get a, a more detailed description from another witness but just at a very high level can you describe what uh, the trainees do at the academy during this pre-service training? Uh, uh, trainees at the academy during pre-service, they're really, it's their first indoctrination uh, into this world of being a police officer. So they're being taught about city and statutory laws. They're uh, being um, uh, trained on procedural justice and critical thinking, uh, defensive tactics. Um, they're having uh, community members come in and speak to them about different um, aspects, whether it relates to um, um, things in our, our cultures uh, within our city. Um, uh, technology is a, is a huge piece to that. Learning uh, how to write reports on our computers. It's, so it's, they're, they're really getting that basic indoctrination into the Minneapolis Police Department. As far as the methodology, uh, is it typically classroom delivery? Do you also have um, practical application? How, how does that work? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a layered approach. Um, it's, it's both the practical academic studying um, uh, examinations that occur, but it's also scenario based. And so uh, there's scenarios that they will go through and whether that's uh, crisis intervention training or other aspects. So it's a layered approach to the training. And in this pre-service uh, training then, once the officer uh, or candidate has completed the pre-service training, What's the next phase before becoming a, a, a fully functioning uh, police officer? Um, once they com complete that training, um, they're making sure obviously that they've re met the requirement for the licensure for the Minnesota Post Board, and then ultimately uh, they're going to get um, sworn in and hired on as Minneapolis police officers. Are you familiar with a program called the uh, Field Training Program or FTO? Yes, I am. Is that part of the pre-service training? That would be, yes. Can you just give us a general description of what the FTO or field training program is? 
Uh, the, the Minneapolis Field Training Officer Program is really once the uh, recruit um, has gone through that series of pre-service training, it's now teaming them up with a, a mentor, basically. And uh, they're being gauged and judged on certain performance measures. Um, and it takes course over a period of several months, usually about five months. And uh, they're given instruction. They're, they're seeing how well they are able to handle certain types of situations, calls. Um, and uh, they're also having feedback, uh, not only from their FTO, but they're also having conversations with the, uh, uh, the supervisors in the uh, training bureau and seeing how they're doing. They're assessing uh, their progression. Um, in the event um, a candidate um, is, is not progressing, they're making sure that there's support mechanisms for that, where do they need extra help. Uh, and yes, at times um, we have candidates that don't successfully complete it. And so, but that's really getting uh, them to the point where they can ultimately um, be really on their own and be able to function on their own as a sworn Minneapolis police officer. Okay. And so once they've completed the field training program, and I think is, you know, per your uh, testimony thus far, the training doesn't stop there. You have post requirements that you have to fulfill every year in your, in your post-service training. Is that right? That is correct. And is that delivered through a, a series of in-service trainings that occur at the same training facility you mentioned? Yes. Is that training uh, optional? Uh, can, it, can an officer go somewhere else to get their post credits and skip the in-service, or is that training required? Uh, that training is required annually. Do you have to take it? Yes, I do. What type of uh, training is provided in the, uh, the post-service training? Um, some of the training that is provided uh, in the annual uh, training can be uh, critical incident training, uh, CIT training. Um, CIT is crisis intervention training? Crisis intervention training, thank you. Yes, crisis intervention training, uh, defensive tactics, um, basic CPR or first aid. Um, uh, those, are, those are some of the types of uh, training that is required annually. Yeah. Um, even though they've already ostensibly been trained on all of these things before, you're still doing the same training annually? That is correct. Why is that? Um, a lot of that is just to reemphasize um, the importance of the training itself, muscle memory, um, because all of our department members are being taught the same thing. Um, we may have officers that are working in a patrol capacity one year, and the next year they may be in investigations, uh, but they may be called to assist upon. And so it's, it's making sure that all of us have that basic necessary uh, core fundamental training uh, to better help serve our communities. And so if you could give the jury kind of an idea of the amount of time that is spent training your officers. It's, it's, it's a lot. We, we put a lot of time, energy, and resources into our our training. Um, I believe last year, uh, the Minneapolis Police Department, in terms of our mandatory in-service training and leadership training, we probably spent about eight and a half million dollars. In our pre-service and in-service training, that was probably about four and a half million dollars. So training is absolutely vitally essential uh, to us as a department. And, and officers are paid while they're being trained, is that correct? Yes, they are. And would it be fair to say that part of the objective of training is to impart um, Minneapolis Police Departmental policies onto the officers so that they know what, the, what those policies are and are able to apply them? Yes, it's, it's important through training that we're reemphasizing uh, not only our policies but really our values as a police department um, and what our community expects of us. Uh, it's to help our officers and it's also to help our communities at the same time. Uh, as, a, as a former patrol officer who's used force, put handcuffs on people, I mean you understand the reality of what policing is like when you're actually on duty, is that right? That is correct. Um, you also testified that you've participated and continue to participate in the training that's been provided by MPD and has continued to be provided. Is that yes, right? that is correct. Is this training um, practical and useful? Yes, it is. Why do you say that? Uh, our 
officers are being called, particularly patrol officers are being called to, again, uh, respond in a way to our community's needs. And it's hundreds of thousands of calls that they respond to. And, um, you know, we are a very interesting profession in that to some professions, your body of work matters. And to an extent within the Minneapolis Police Department, our body of work matters, but it's more internally. Uh, but to our communities, for the most part, your body of work doesn't hold as much value. Um, we don't have the luxury of being able to go up to a community member for the first time and say, you know, those 99 calls I was on before went really well. Trust me on this one. We don't have the luxury of doing that. Our communities are going, no, what have you done for me lately? This interaction, I'm going to grade you on how you treat me uh, during this call, during this interaction. And so, um, so we have to make each engagement with our community count. And so uh, the training is very important uh, because for many in our communities, the first time that they encounter a Minneapolis police officer may be the only time in their life they do. And so that, that singular incident matters. Aside from the usefulness of it to the community, what about the usefulness of it from a practical standpoint to the patrol officer out on the street? Is this, is this training practical or is it more aspirational? No, it's, it's, it's very practical. And as I had mentioned earlier, it's so important that we evolve as a police department and meet our communities um, where they are. And I'll, I'll give a couple examples if, if you don't mind. Um, um, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, within the department that we know that our communities suffer at times and go through trauma. So it's very important for our men and women to have training as it relates to um, uh, how we respond in those moments. What resources can we provide for uh, community? But one of the things that we have not talked about in this profession, and uh, sadly, is the impacts of trauma on our own officers. And so wellness, we do a great deal of training and work on officer wellness because uh, we need to make sure that our officers are well when they're interacting with our communities uh, uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, I, I will also tell you a few years ago, um, we were hearing from members of our uh, transgender community and how they had felt police have played a role in their lives and not always not always good quite frankly and so we were able to through conversation through discussion through meetings uh, being very authentic we were able to sit and craft a policy based upon uh, members of our transgender gender nonconforming community really guiding that uh, and we had the first policy ever in that and so again it's so important that we as a police agency continue to evolve continue to uh, place value on all of our community members, and so that's very important. Now, uh, speaking of uh, Minneapolis police policies, you're aware that the police department has a, a fairly extensive policy and procedure manual. It's pretty thick, correct? Yes. And uh, is it important then for policies and procedures to be in a written form so that officers can understand what the expectations are? Yes, it is. And those are uh, public documents so that the public, they're also able to see what the expectations of the police officers are, correct? That is correct. Uh, as the chief of police and being employed by MPD as long as you have, uh, I take it you're familiar with the Minneapolis Police Department policy and procedure manuals and all the content contained inside? Yes. You, in fact, created some of these policies? That is correct. Uh, it, and uh, are Minneapolis police officers required to be familiar with the various written policies? Yes, we are. And there's a policy requiring them to be familiar with the policies, correct? Yes, that is correct. All right. So if you would please publish Exhibit 207. Uh, if you would highlight uh, Section 1-103. This is the policy about the policy, and it requires that the MPD employees shall be provided instructions on how to access the policy and procedure manual. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. 
and they're accountable for knowing how to and where how and where to access and for knowing the contents of the manual. Is that right? That is correct. And they're also required to sign a receipt acknowledging their responsibility for knowing the contents of the manual, correct? Yes. Because you know the first uh, policy manual that you would receive as a patrol officer might not be you know, 30 years later, uh, what you're gonna be looking at, correct? Yes. So the policies are changing, but they're published, they're public, and the officers are required to know what they are and to sign something saying that they uh, will continue to review them. Is that right? That, it's preliminary, overruled. Yes. All right. Well, uh, if you could take that one down, please. Um, at this time, Uh, asked to just a display to the witness, Exhibit 274 for identification. Um, sir, do you recognize this is a general form here of being an electronic version of the MPD policy and procedure manual acknowledgement? Yes, I do. This is uh, an example of an acknowledgement form that a Minneapolis Police uh, Department employee patrol officer would sign upon being hired, is that right? Yes. Just indicating that they're aware that there are written policies and committing to um, reviewing them and accessing them, is that right? Yes. Um, you, uh, at this time, I'm gonna offer Exhibit 274. Two seventy four is received. All right. If we could then publish Exhibit two seventy four to the jury, and you see this is a, again um, one of the forms that was signed by a particular officer upon hire. And if you could please highlight the name, and that's uh, signed by Derek Chauvin. Chauvin. I'm so sorry, Derek Chauvin. Um, Badge 1087, December uh, 28, 2001. Is that correct? Yes. If you could take that down, please. Minneapolis Police Department has a code of ethics. Is that right? Yes. And the code of ethics is contained uh, within the policy manual. Forgive me, we're gonna be talking a lot about the policy manual, I kind of march through some of these, but um, the Code of Ethics, if you could please uh, display Exhibit 215, page two, and if you could highlight 5-10201. And as the uh, Code of Ethics provides in the policy manual, law enforcement officers' fundamental duty to serve mankind and safeguard lives and property, and to protect the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression and intimidation. Is that right? That is correct. And if you could take that down, uh, Minneapolis Police Department also has a professional policing policy, is that right? Yes. At a high level, can you describe what professional policing means in this context? 
Yes, uh, our Minneapolis Police Department, professional policing, um, it's, it's really about treating people with dignity and respect Ab above all else at the highest level. It's, it's that we see each other as necessary, we value one another, and it's, it's really treating people with the dignity and respect they deserve. If we could display then exhibit 215. And drawing your attention to uh, page four, uh, section 5-104.01. Sir, is this the professional uh, policing policy? Yes, it is. And could you read the first bullet, please? Uh, the first bullet reads, be courteous, respectful, polite, and professional. And if you would then also read the third bullet. Ensure that the length of any detention is no longer than necessary to take appropriate action for the known or suspected offense. And you can take that down, please. Uh, sir, uh, fair to say that law enforcement generally has changed a lot since you started back in 1989, is that right? That is correct. 1989, you didn't have body-worn cameras, correct? That is correct. And uh, nor did you have sort of the uh, ability for civilians, bystanders, to video or record conduct of police officers, right? We did not. Um, because we didn't have smartphones. That's true. And now we do. Yes. And as you indicated, the policies and culture of the police department has to change with the times, is that right? Yes. Um, and so in terms of understanding that sometimes bystanders do use their smartphones to take uh, video images of police officers, have you, or has the Minneapolis Police Department imparted any training or uh, constructed any policies to prepare officers for people recording them? Yes, we, we have. Um, we've um, imparted policy that really is informing officers that individuals under their First Amendment rights, they have the absolute First Amendment right to record uh, through cell phone video or other types of uh, video uh, officers uh, interacting or engaging with a community member with the exception that they cannot obstruct uh, the, the activity of the officers, but they absolutely have the right, uh, barring that, to record us performing our, our duties. And what does obstruct mean in this context? Ob obstruct would mean interfering, uh, doing something where you are physically placing yourself in a position where you can no longer, you're no longer or you're prohibiting uh, the officers for carrying out their lawful duties. But barring that, um, uh, individuals have the right to record our, our engagement with our community. Well, Chief, you'd have to acknowledge that a patrol officer may find it irritating to have a civilian recording their activities. True? Very true. Is that obstruction? It is not. Uh, at this time, I'd like to display to the witness uh, only Exhibit 273. And if I may step away for a moment. And at this time, I will offer Exhibit 273. Any objection? No objection. 273 is received. If you would publish uh, 273, and I'd like to draw your attention to uh, Section 9-202. And again, this is the public recording of police activities, providing employees guidance with uh, dealing with members of the public, uh, recording them, is that right? Yes, it is. And uh, generally, this informs officers that unless you're being obstructed, people get to record you? Yes. Even if you don't like it? That is correct. And how long has this been policy of MPD? Uh, uh, since May of 2016. All right. Thank you. You can take that down. Sir, are you familiar with the concept of de-escalation? Yes. 
What is de-escalation? De-escalation is providing a knowledge base or skills, in this case for officers, to really focus on um, time, options, and resources. It, it's really primarily uh, trying to provide an opportunity to stabilize a situation, um, to de-escalate it, and with the goal is having a safe, safe and peaceful outcome. And, um, and so that's, there's tools associated with that, but that's really the goal of de-escalation. Time, options, and resources so that we can stabilize the situation peacefully and safely. When you think of de-escalation, are you thinking of it as the sort of the opposite of using force, or is it a part of using force? We teach it as both. And uh, when you started with the department back in 1989, was there an emphasis on de-escalation? It was not mentioned. Okay. It's not heard of back then. Okay. When did de-escalation start becoming uh, more of a topic of conversation in law enforcement communities? I, I think that right around late 90s, 2000, I think that when um, we were um, when there was a tension, not only in Minneapolis, but in departments across the country, and incidents particularly involving um, police encounters with those who were suffering from mental illness, we really started to see a lot of work on that. Um, here locally, uh, the Barbara Schneider Foundation, uh, there was a very tragic incident in Minneapolis many years ago uh, that involved the death of a community member, but when we started that was really what kind of culminated for our department, uh, de-escalation. And, um, uh, and even when you heard departments starting to talk about other tools like tasers, all of these types of things, it was around that time frame that uh, uh, I think our department really started getting um, a lot more education, awareness, and training as it relates to de-escalation. What about just, you know, even if you weren't taught de-escalation formally when you started back in 1989, as a practical matter in practice, is that something that's been employed by experienced police officers for a long time now? Yes, yes it has. What about in your own experience? When you were on patrol, uh, did you use de-escalation techniques? Yes, quite a bit, yes. And did you find them to be effective, a way to maybe talk somebody down from a, situa a situation rather than needing to use force? Yes, and, and with the primary goal is that you know you want to keep um, yourself safe as an officer, and you also want to keep the community safe. And so, uh, a lot of it hinged on communication and listening and, and, and verbal skills. And so, um, uh, if you could talk your way out of a situation to de-escalate where it didn't have to result in physical force, uh, those were things you certainly uh, utilized, and you were always in a better position to look upon someone that you worked with who, was, who had that skill set to do that. Uh, but if you can't talk somebody uh, out of the situation, if you can't de-escalate, you can't, right? And you have to then use a, a different method. That is true. Okay. And so it really comes to what's, uh, what's, what's reasonable at the time, is that right? Yes. Does Minneapolis uh, Police Department currently have uh, a de-escalation policy? We do. And at this time, if I can display uh, Exhibit 219. It, you have this one. Okay. I think it is admitted. I just want to make sure you have it. Okay. Yes, if we could publish Exhibit 219. And then uh, Minneapolis Police Department policy. Uh, five dash three oh four threatening the use of force and de escalation. This is the policy and it's a policy as it existed on May twenty five, two thousand twenty. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, if we could highlight the first uh, paragraph, paragraph A threatening the use of force. Okay. And I'd like you, sir, to please uh, just read into the record the paragraph that you see here. Uh, all the way up until the, I guess the first sentence will make you read the whole thing. Uh, as an alternative and or the precursor to the actual use of force, 
MPD officers shall consider verbally announcing their intent to use force, including displaying an authorized weapon as a threat of force when reasonable under the circumstances. And uh, I guess, is it an either or alternative? Is it like you either de-escalate or use force and once you start using force you just give up on de-escalation? Uh, the, the goal is to resolve the situation as safely as possible. So uh, you want to always have de-escalation um, layered into those actions of using force. And if you could take that down and highlight paragraph B, de-escalation. In accordance with the policy, uh, officers, the language here is mandatory when reasonable, whenever reasonable, shall use de-escalation tactics to gain voluntary compliance. Is that right? Yes. And to seek to avoid or to minimize the use of physical force, correct? Yes. And seeking to minimize uh, physical force, that can be happening while physical force is being employed, can't it? Yes. An officer can be using physical force and during the course of that still maintain attempts to de-escalate and defuse the situation. Yes. Okay. And uh, if you could clear that, please. And as part of a de-escalation, the policy indicates the officers are supposed to do what? Attempt to slow down or stabilize the situation so that more time, options, and resources are available. Now, when you talk about more time, options, and resources, could uh, options and resources include um, for example, using other officers who may be at the scene. Yes. Or calling for backup. Yes. Actually, it can also include seeking community's help in a situation as well. And in uh, employing de-escalation techniques, uh, accordance, in accordance with the policy, the officer is required to consider a number of factors regarding the subject. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and we're assuming here that the subject is non-compliant. You run into uh, people who, you know, maybe don't want to comply uh, with police officers, um, but you can also run into people who just for some reason are unable to do so at that moment. Is that right? Yes. And uh, officers are required to consider, if you could highlight B and the bullets that come underneath. Officers under the Minneapolis de-escalation policy are required to consider whether the subject's lack of compliance is a deliberate attempt to resist or an inability. Is that right? Yes. And if you could read, uh, you know, first, uh, the first bullet is uh, medical or medical conditions, correct? Yes. We have mental impairment, uh, developmental disability, uh, physical limitations, some of you may just be physically unable to comply, correct? Yes. Um, uh, language barrier, uh, you know, the city of Minneapolis uh, has a variety of people who speak a variety of different languages, someone just may not understand you, right? That is correct. And if you're not considering that, you know, perhaps the situation could escalate into something greater than it would need to be. Yes. Um, the last two bullets, um, first, uh, could you read the second to the last bullet? Yes, um, one of the other considerations officers should take into account is the influence of drug or alcohol use. How so? Um, we know the research says that uh, people can react differently when they're under the use of alcohol or drugs, and so um, you trying to give verbal commands um, if someone's under the use of alcohol or drugs or you're doing force it, it may have a different reaction to them so that should be something that uh, you should be considering and uh, 1230 okay. um, sir uh, drug or alcohol use I mean in this context is being uh, required that the officer consider to determine 
if de-escalation is appropriate. It can be true that being people, some people who are under the influence of drugs or alcohol can become dangerous, correct? That is correct. Um, but isn't it also true that some people react completely different and they are not necessarily dangerous if they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs? That is correct. Uh, in fact, uh, they may not be more dangerous, they may actually be more vulnerable. True. And it's important that the officer considers that when determining whether to go the route of force or continued force or de-escalation. Fair? Yes. Um, behavioral crisis is the last uh, bullet I'd like you to discuss. What do you mean by behavioral crisis? Uh, behavioral crisis, um, of, of all the bullets sometimes, that is probably the one that our men and women experience uh, in our communities most. Uh, if someone loses a job, that can, that can trigger a behavioral crisis. If someone loses um, a loved one, that can trigger a behavioral crisis. Um, if someone has uh, um, uh, themselves got the worst diagnosis from their doctor that day, that can trigger a behavioral crisis. And so we want our folks to take all of those things into consideration. When I talk about meeting our community where they are, that's probably the one that we need to really focus on. Yeah. And as you testified earlier, the, the police just don't get to meet people on their very best day, do they? No, they don't. And uh, the behavioral crisis, uh, as the kind you've described here, can in fact be a barrier to compliance. Uh, in, in a, it would cause an inability to comply even if not, uh, you know, an intentional inability to comply. That's fair. Let's go to the list, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so the purpose of the, uh, I'm sorry, of the listing a behavioral crisis as a, as a point of consideration for a law enforcement officer is what? Um, again, it, it's recognizing that um, when we get the call from our communities, uh, it may not often be their best day, and they may be experiencing something that is very traumatic, um, but we're going to respond, but we have to take that into consideration uh, because, as I mentioned again, we may be the first and last time they have an interaction with a Minneapolis police officer, and so we have to make it count. It matters. Would this be a good time to stop before I go in the next line? I'm sorry, I was trying to push it to the time limit. So. All right, members of the jury, we'll take our lunch break. Come back at 1.30. Chief, you may step down.
Just a reminder, Chief, you're still under oath. If you could please display and publish Exhibit 219 again. All right, sir, uh, before the break, uh, we were discussing the de-escalation policy. I'd like to now ask uh, whether the actual de-escalation techniques are uh, embedded within the policy itself. And so I'm drawing your attention to, again, uh, Exhibit 219, which is MPD Policy 5-304. And uh, if you can take a look at the section here that's been enlarged, de-escalation tactics include but are not limited to. If you would please just uh, summarize for the jury the different bullets that you see here. Uh, yes, some of the, the bullets here for uh, de-escalation tactics. Sir, uh, one moment. Oh. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, please resume. Uh, yes, some of the uh, de-escalation tactics uh, that are noted here uh, include but are not limited to placing barriers between an uncooperative subject and an officer, uh, communication from a safe position intended to gain the subject's compliance using verbal persuasion, advisements or warnings, um, using verbal techniques to calm an agitated subject and promote rational decision making, uh, calling for additional resources to assist, including more officers, CIT officers, and officers equipped with less lethal tools. And CIT officers are those who've uh, been through the crisis intervention training course, is that correct? That is correct. And are Minneapolis police officers then at the training center taught different techniques on how to implement this policy? That is correct. Have you personally attended the training? Yes, I have. Uh, did you find it useful? I have. And then you could remove that. We, we've talked a little bit then about uh, behavioral <clears throat> crises and identifying behavioral crises. Uh, how does the Minneapolis Police Department respond to persons in a behavioral crisis? Um, one of the first important things is uh, obviously is trying to get as much information prior to the call as possible. Um, but as soon as uh, officers at least have knowledge that this could be a potential situation with that caller, um, uh, this de-escalation piece should kick in. Mm -hmm. And, and that they, um, while they may not know exactly what they're going to encounter when they uh, arrive on the scene, um, this body of knowledge that they've been taught uh, should at least be kind of forefront in terms of the different tools that they'll be use, using possibly uh, to help de-escalate that situation. Uh, what is an EDP, what is that acronym? Uh, the acronym EDP um, is labeled through our Minneapolis Emergency Communications Center as a emotional, emotionally disturbed person. And so when our Minneapolis police officers receive a EDP call, uh, that is prompting them that there's at least initial information that they're going to be responding to someone who may be in crisis. Okay. And that's something that the officer would then be communicated uh, by a dispatcher prior to going to the scene, correct? That is correct. Uh, however, when they are, if, if that information is not imparted upon them, they make their own assessment at the scene as to whether the person could potentially be an EDP. Is that correct? That is correct. It, you indicated that uh, the Minneapolis Police Department receives uh, over 100,000 calls a year, calls for service. Is that right? Yes. Do you have an idea of how many calls for service involve people uh, in crisis? Um, I believe in 2019, Minneapolis police officers responded to uh, about 4,500 uh, of those signified as EDP calls. Yes. Now, in terms of teaching officers how to recognize uh, a person who may potentially be in crisis and therefore unable to comply with commands, uh, you uh, place these different uh, signs into MPD policy. That is correct. And I'd like to direct your attention now to Exhibit 231 and ask that to be published. And this is 7-809, uh, the Crisis Intervention 
policy, you see it begins here, oops, sorry, but we'll uh, go ahead and over to page two. And uh, I'd like to highlight, please, for the jury, the definition of a crisis. And again, uh, in the definition of a crisis under uh, MPD policy, uh, generally speaking, uh, we're talking about some of the same things that we saw before in the de-escalation policy, is that right? That is correct. Uh, there can be uh, uh, mental illness, is that right? Yes. Substance abuse uh, can be a, a crisis or a barrier to communication, correct? Yes. And, and same with uh, various stressors, is that right? Yes. And then further, if you can uh, emphasize the crisis intervention definition. And officers, when they uh, either respond to an EDP call or are aware that the person may be in crisis, can attempt a crisis intervention uh, method. Is that correct? Yes. And generally speaking, what is uh, the officer supposed to do to a person in crisis? Uh, it's an attempt to de-escalate that, that situation. And the policy then of the Minneapolis Police Department in handling persons in crisis, if we could look at section three of the policy, would be the next page, highlight Roman three. Okay, in accordance uh, with the Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy, what, what are officers supposed to do? How are they supposed to handle encounters with individuals who are experiencing a crisis? Um, we really want to, again, we want to meet people where they are, we want to bring our values um, and our principles to those situations. Um, we recognize that oftentimes people who are experiencing crisis, it is not something that they brought on themselves, but they're dealing with. And so there's a sense of dignity and respect that we should be honoring when we come to those calls. And so, uh, as it's mentioned here, uh, the values of, of protection, safety, and sanctity of life uh, oftentimes, again, we are that first face of government that they're going to see. Uh, that may be 3 o'clock in the morning. And so um, we have to wear many hats, but we, we want to be respectful in that care that we're trying to provide for that individual. And, and sometimes uh, persons might be experiencing some sort of a breakdown that you know maybe they did partially bring upon themselves. Is that right? That is correct. And the, are those people still entitled to be treated in accordance with MPD policy? Yes, they are. And this, uh, this policy, again, is imparted in training at the training center uh, by that group. Is that right? That is correct. Now, I'd like to, if you could take that down, please, uh, talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, officers' role as first responders in terms of providing basic uh, medical care, all right? And so uh, with that, can you uh, tell the jury, are Minneapolis police officers trained to provide basic medical care? Yes, we are. Hey, can we you are. please describe what what level, I'm aware there are various different levels of medical care that someone could be um, trained in. So most of uh, department members will have at least a basic training in terms of uh, first responder, the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, um, uh, the effects of um, um, applying direct pressure on wounds to stop bleeding, uh, many of the things um, that we will respond to perhaps just because we're closer to a call than perhaps our EMS or our fire before they get there. And they obviously have a higher degree level of training. But um, the training that we have and that we receive, it's very vital because those seconds are vital. Uh, our officers carry tourniquets. Uh, we respond to situations where members in our community uh, will have gunshot wounds. And uh, matter of fact, a couple of my officers a couple of weeks ago saved a young man who was shot in the femur and was bleeding profusely, but because they got there quickly, knew how to apply that tourniquet. Those are some of the basics. Direct pre baby not breathing calls. 
our officers have saved the lives of, of children uh, who've choked or what have you because they've applied or they've been able to help start uh, emergency breathing for them. So those are, those are some of the basic types of first aid uh, that are uh, chest compressions, uh, those types of uh, basic first aid. And are officers then, uh, you know, specifically trained at the training center to provide this basic sort of uh, first aid? That is correct. And do, is the, does the Minneapolis Police Department have a policy uh, regarding any duty that an officer would have to apply that training to a real life situation? Yes. Um, we, we recognize, again, I mentioned that we are oftentimes going to be the first ones to respond to someone who needs medical uh, attention and uh, and so we absolutely have a, a duty uh, to render that aid and that of course is in the policy and procedure manual is that right yes if I can display exhibit 230 which is uh, MPD policy 7-350 emergency medical response and in under Roman 1 you see that the purpose of the policy is to uh, lay out in writing the roles and responsibilities of Minneapolis Police Department employees in incidents involving a medical emergency. Is that right? Yes. If we uh, could take a look at the policy itself self under uh, Roman 2, does that uh, explain what a Minneapolis police officer is supposed to do when they come upon a medical emergency or a medical emergency develops on a call? Yes. Right. What are they supposed to do? Um, one, while awaiting EMS, MPD employees assisting an individual having an acute medical crisis shall provide any necessary first aid consistent with our MPD training as soon as practical. And so then that presumes, of course, they're waiting for EMS or waiting for some kind of emergency services. Is that right? That is correct. So would it be fair to say that this policy then is in two parts? The officer has to request EMS or an ambulance, correct? Yes. And while waiting for the ambulance, they have to provide, they're required to provide, what uh, medical training and skills they have to attempt to save the person. That is correct. Uh, are Minneapolis police officers provided uh, naloxone or Narcan kits? Yes, we, we are. What are those? Um, it is, it is basically an inhaler uh, for community members who we may uh, respond to have overdosed. Um, it is to, if they've overdosed and are out, it is to give them that uh, inhaler uh, injection so that they um, can hopefully come to. And so we've, uh, it was a few years ago where, uh, for the most part, our Minneapolis Fire Department were the ones that responded to overdose and carried uh, the Narcan. Uh, unfortunately, in our cities, cities across the country saw an uptick in uh, heroin and opioid overdoses. We had to make sure that we were, again, because we were oftentimes the first ones to come across these situations, we wanted to make sure that we were in service to our communities and making sure that we, if we could save lives, that we were equipping our folks with Narcan. And a policy developed as a result of this, is that right? That is correct. If I can show you uh, Exhibit 229, it's published at. Is this the, the Narcan policy 7-348? That is correct, yes. And our officers um, provided training in the administration of Narcan? Yes. Under appropriate circumstances? Yes. Okay. And uh, now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the use of force. Does uh, Minneapolis have a written policy governing a proper and authorized use of force. Yes, we do. Okay. And is this generally covered in the 5-300 uh, series of the Policy and Procedure Manual? Yes, it is. I'd like to discuss uh, some of that manual with you and the policy with you uh, at this time. If we could pull and display Exhibit 216. Under the purpose of the policy, which is 5-301, uh, can you please read the first uh, sentence under uh, subparagraph A? Yes. Sanctity of life and the protection of the public shall be the cornerstones of the MPD's use of force policy. What does that mean? Of all the things that we do as peace officers uh, for the Minneapolis Police Department, 
Um, and I mentioned the thousands of calls that our men and women respond to. Uh, it is my firm belief that the one singular incident we will be judged forever on will be our use of force. And so while it is absolutely imperative that our officers go home at the end of their shift, we want to make sure and ensure that our community members go home too. And so sanctity of life is absolutely vital that that is the pillar for our use of force. Uh, has this generally always been the case with Minneapolis use of force policy? It is not. When did that change? Um, we implemented this particular uh, in 2016. Has the training and use of force and application of use of force policy been imparted, uh, including this philosophy, onto police officers in training at the training center? It certainly has, yes. Does the policy itself define force? What is force? Uh, yes, it does. If we can take a look at Exhibit um, 217, I'll publish that. If you'd highlight use of force. Generally speaking, what is force? Um, it can be your, uh, any physical contact. It can uh, be with a weapon. It could be with a vehicle. Uh, but it's any sort of physical contact that is more likely to render harm or injury uh, to someone. Uh, is a restraint, is the use of restraint considered force? That would be considered force. And what type of force is authorized under a departmental policy? Um, we, uh, under 609, the, um, we operate under the use of force, the Graham v. Connor statute. Objectively reasonable force. And if I could display Exhibit 217. Uh, first, uh, go back uh, to 5-303. 5-303 authorizes force, is that right? And you mentioned 60906, state statute authorizing force under certain circumstances, is that right? Yes. And uh, the phrase that's used uh, for the authorization of force is what type of force? Reasonable. And that force can be authorized under certain circumstances, is that right? Yes. All right, so now if you would uh, uh, go to the next page. And let's talk about the circumstances under which a police officer is authorized properly uh, to use force. If you highlight that. What are the circumstances under which an, authorized, an officer is authorized to use force? Uh, an officer is authorized to use force uh, affecting a lawful arrest, uh, executing a legal process, uh, enforcing an order of the court, and any other duties imposed uh, upon that officer. And that term reasonable force is further delineated in the policy, is that right? Yes. If we take a look at uh, Exhibit 217, I believe under the definition, objectively reasonable force. Could you please read that definition? Yes, uh, the amount and type of force that would be considered rational and logical to an objective officer on the scene, uh, supported by facts and circumstances known to an officer at the time the force was used. Oh, you discussed a, a case, the, the Connor, right? The Connor factors, yes. and I'd like you to, um, uh, well, first of all, is the policy reference the Connor factors that you just mentioned? Yes. If you could uh, display 217, page 2. Right. And we have uh, three bullet points here under the Connor factors. And that is uh, the officer is supposed to look at the, the totality of the circumstances, right? Yes. And the three bullets uh, here that the officer is supposed to uh, consider are what? Uh, the officer should consider the severity of the crime at issue whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and whether he is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. And uh, fair to say these, uh, these three different considerations are things that you can attribute to the subject, correct? 
Yes. That's the subject's conduct, not someone else's. Yes. And of course, it has to be judged uh, by a reasonable police officer on the scene at the time, correct? Yes. Now, do you recall, uh, and obviously you're here talking about uh, what happened on May 25, 2020, uh, involving George Floyd. Do you recall why the officers were responding to Cup Foods on that day, the original reason for the call? Uh, the, the original reason for the call was a response regarding um, a counterfeit uh, uh, situation at the store at the intersection of 38th and Chicago. In, in terms of uh, you know, the deployment of your resources at the Minneapolis Police Department and as chief, uh, how do you rate, I guess, the severity of that offense, the seriousness of that offense? Uh, it would probably not rise to the level of, um, and particularly in light of uh, uh, last year, the level of violent crime that we've experienced in the city, but it, uh, um, we would certainly respond to it, but it would not rise to the level in terms of uh, severity of, of the crime here. Um, in, in looking at the, the particular type of crime, is that one for which uh, a suspect is typically taken into a custodial arrest? Typically not. And why is that? Um, if, if it's not a violent felon, felony, um, we also, in uh, coordination with our, our, our jail system and our courts, um, we've, there's been a shift over the years to make sure that the individuals who are going to jail are those who, uh, from a public safety standpoint, um, need to be at least in that facility, in the Hennepin County Jail, uh, and if we can I, properly identify, and, and it's not a violent situation, um, um, you know, we can always charge via complaint and other things, and so, um, so that's one of the reasons why. You use the, 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 the phrase, I guess, violent felony. What's the, what's the more important part, whether it's violent or whether it's a felony? Well, violence. Why is that? Well, it can certainly uh, endanger not only the officers, but the community where something that's merely labeled a felony may or may not uh, require a full custodial arrest. That is correct. And are uh, Minneapolis police officers trained in the use of force? Yes. In uh, pre-service, in the academy, and uh, also in uh, post-service, at uh, um, the in-service training? Yes. And are officers taught the standard that force must be reasonable at the time it is applied? Yes. The entire time it's applied? Yes. Are officers taught uh, the need to assess and reassess and reevaluate situations uh, in the field? Yes, we are. Are you familiar with Minneapolis Police Department's uh, uh, critical thinking model? Yes. How are you familiar with that? Uh, it was something that I wanted to embark and uh, make sure that it was part of our training curriculum that also includes um, the aspects of procedural justice. And uh, procedural justice is really, it's, it's actually research and evidence-based um, learning that has shown that if police departments um, treat people with respect, give them voice, um, establish neutral engagements, and um, build areas of trust, it, um, our communities are more likely to cooperate with us. We are likely to be seen more as legitimate. Uh, it is actually shown that our employees are uh, come to work, their wellness is better, and so, um, so this is very important uh, work. And so it's, it's part of that procedural justice I just mentioned is part of that critical thinking in our training. At this time, I'd ask to display only to the witness exhibit uh, for identification 276. Sir, do you recognize uh, exhibit 276 as being uh, MPD's critical decision-making model? Yes. Uh, offer exhibit 276. Any objection? No objection. 276 is received. Permission to publish. So we, we heard about the model, now we get to actually see it. And if you could enlarge the, the graphic, please. All right, so this is what the model looks like. It's sort of a wheel, is that right? 
Yes. And the first uh, stage of the critical thinking model, decision making model, is information gathering. Yes. Explain that, please. Uh, it's, it's very vital. Um, we rely upon um, trying to gather as much information as possible so that we can um, try our best to effectively um, go in, respond, and, and manage that situation. Um, trying to gather as much information at the onset is very important, but we also need to make sure that we're continuing to uh, try to gather as much information as we're, we're dealing with the, uh, uh, the scene or the call. I see the arrow points in two directions, and one it points to the middle of the circle, voice, neutrality, respect, and trust, and the other arrow points to the threat or risk assessment. Um, let's talk about uh, the middle of the circle first. What is uh, that middle circle supposed to be representing? Well, that's, that's the principles, really, of what continues to guide us. So, for example, information gathering, while we may associate it specifically with uh, receiving a 911 call and the dispatcher uh, giving us information, but um, information gathering could be that officers come across a call that they weren't dispatched to and they need to talk to a community member. If they don't treat that community member with respect or give them voice, it's likely that uh, they will receive less information that will be less helpful in them resolving that call. So that voice, neutrality, respect, and trust, that has to guide and be a part of all of that critical um, decision-making model. So let's go to the next step. The officers gathered some initial information and now uh, the officer is in a position to need to think about it or assess it, is that right? Yes. And so the next uh, step is a threat or risk assessment. Um, is there a difference between a threat and a risk? Um, there, there can be in terms of, in terms of um, what is being played out at, at the time. Um, and you're, you're constantly evaluating that. And of course, the information that you're receiving uh, which may be fluid, is, is going to dictate that threat or risk, yes. And so then once the officer has made an assessment of a threat or a risk, um, the next step, authority to act, what does that mean? Um, that may mean the officer now based upon that the information that they've received, uh, evaluating that threat or risk, um, am I going to act? Is this going to be a, a physical arrest? Um, am I going to separate parties? Um, am I going to, does this require report? All of these things, so, um, but it's, it's giving more information for the officer to guide he or she in terms of what is the next appropriate step they, they need to act and take. And so if we were to, at least to, to this point in the, in the model, put a scenario into action, the information gathering, the officer perceives that someone is um, approaching them uh, with a weapon, like a, like a bat. And so then they would reflect on that and determine whether or not the, this is a, a risk, it's a, it's a bat, maybe the person is at a baseball game, or a threat, the bat is being brandished, correct? Yes. Then after that, under authority to act, if they've determined that this in fact is a risk uh, and that they're being threatened, they would look at the authority back to the MPD policy and procedure manual, is that right? Yes. Under what is the use of force policy what tools are available to me to respond here. Yes. Okay. Um, the next step then after uh, considering the authority to act, uh, goals and actions, what is that? Uh, the, the goals, uh, the officer is making an assessment. So with the authority to act, will an arrest resolve this situation? Will separating the two parties be enough? Um, um, is, is taking a report Will, will that be enough of a goal or an action? Um, uh, it may mean a combination of things. It may mean that I'm going to have to, or the officers are going to have to make an arrest, but we may need additional resources here because the situation is still, could have the potential to not be stabilized. And so, uh, so all of that is part of that goals and action. And then uh, to review and reassess, uh, assuming that means exactly what it says. Exactly, yes. And it, uh, Information is going to flow, dynamics can change, and so it can be a constant just review and assess, reassess the situation to make sure that we're trying to get to 
uh, the best possible outcome in this, peacefully and safely. Because circumstances can change, the situation can change, correct? Yes. And force that might be appropriate at one moment might not be appropriate at a different moment, uh, or more fight force might be needed at, a, at yet another point, is that right? Yes. This uh, particular critical thinking model, Exhibit uh, 276, uh, we see examples of this throughout training materials uh, that are provided by the trainers at the facility. Is that right? Yes. And why is that? Uh, it's to, to really embed that knowledge that um, you know we don't want to fall susceptible to kind of check the box training. This, this training is important for all of our officers uh, to have a knowledge and understanding of, um, and that our community members can expect this to be consistent as, as they have encounters or engagements with our officers. All right, um, if we could take that down, please. And I want to shift a little bit to talk about, um, we've talked about use of force and the policy. Does Minneapolis uh, Police Department train its officers in specific defensive tactics? Yes. And where does that training occur? Uh, that training occurs at our Special Operations Center. And does the department provide uh, training for officers in handling uncooperative uh, individuals? Yes. Uh, does the department tr uh, provide training for um, handcuffing uh, reluctant suspects? Yes. And when you provide the training, you're assuming you're taking someone into custody, do you also teach officers their responsibilities, uh, their personal responsibility with respect to the person they've just taken into custody? Yes, we do. And, and what responsibility does an officer have to a person they've taken into custody or restrained? So, the, the American policing profession which I believe is the best in the world. And I will tell you why, and it's really two reasons. Counsel, you rephrase your question? Y yes, Your Honor. Um, sir, you have a responsibility, I guess, uh, and that's imparted throughout officers in various forms of training as to what, uh, once someone is in their custody. Oh, yes. Yeah. We, we, have, we have a duty of care. Mm -hmm. And so when someone is in our custody, um, regardless if they're a suspect, uh, we have an obligation to make sure that we provide for their care. Does that include um, people to whom uh, uh, defensive tactics are being applied? Yes. Why is that? Um, they are still in our, um, they're still in our custody and um, they have rights. And um, the humanity of this profession, we need to make sure that we're taking care of them. So how often are officers required to participate in defensive tactics training? Uh, it's usually yearly, annual training. Uh, do you know that, you know, when we're talking about the training and policies in effect uh, on May 25, 2020, were neck restraints and chokeholds taught and authorized by uh, MPD policy at the time. At that time, yes. And they were taught pursuant to the uh, defensive tactics training as well? Yes. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, publish Exhibit 224. Exhibit 224 uh, showing MPD policy 5-311, use of restraints uh, neck restraints and chokeholds. You see a chokehold is considered a deadly force option, is that right? Yes. Okay. If you could go to the next page, please. Uh, neck restraint, if you could highlight that portion from that down to unconscious neck restraint. Okay. There are various types of neck restraints that were authorized at the time, is that right? Yes. And uh, neck restraint uh, was defined as compressing one or both sides of a neck, person's neck with an arm or a leg, is that right? Yes. But without applying any direct pressure to the trachea, the airway, that needs to be protected? Yes. Right. And there were two types of neck restraints that were authorized, conscious neck restraint and unconscious neck restraint. 
Yes. And the objective of the uh, unconscious neck restraint, the second one, would be to have the person actually pass out. That is correct. And, and under uh, certain circumstances uh, in which um, uh, the officer was in fear of uh, grave bodily harm or death, that would be authorized. Is that right? Yes. And conscious neck restraints uh, were more with the neck restraint with the intent to control but not to render the subject unconscious. Is that right? Yes. Uh, by applying light to moderate pressure. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And if you could uh, go to Roman 2 on the same policy, highlight that. Okay. Conscious neck restraint uh, can be used for someone who is actively resisting, correct? Yes. And an unconscious neck restraint could be used for a person who is using a, exhibiting active aggression or to save a person's life, is that right? Yes. Okay. Or on a subject who is um, exhibiting active resistance if lesser attempts would have uh, or would likely to be ineffective, is that right? Yes. But not, no, not, uh, neck restraints were not to be used against persons who were merely passively resisting, correct? That is correct. Now I'd like to draw your attention to May 25, 2020. Um, can you tell the jury when you first learned of the incident involving the defendant, um, officers Tao, Lane, and King, and George Floyd? Um, on Monday um, evening, around 9 p.m., back on May 25, uh, 2020, uh, I received a call, I was at my, my residence, and I received a call from one of my, uh, I believe it was a deputy chief, who had uh, informed me that um, Minneapolis police officers uh, had responded to 38th in Chicago. Um, and while attempting to take someone into custody, um, that, uh, which I learned now to be Mr. Floyd, um, um, they believed that he would not make it or survive. And so uh, he was being transported via ambulance uh, to, at that time, Hennepin County Medical Center. Um, and while um, at least the information I had that evening at 9 p.m., um, at that time at least was, I was told was still alive, um, I decided to uh, contact the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And they are a state agency that conducts our critical incidents. Uh, I deem that this would be a critical incident and it has been our protocol to uh, alert them uh, and they would conduct that um, investigation. So I made that call to the BCA uh, to have them start to conduct this critical incident. Did you then proceed to City Hall? Um, I should also say that I, um, right after that call, I notified uh, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry to say that this is a situation we have at least right now and that I would brief him um, as I received more information. I, I then proceeded to leave my residence and I um, uh, went directly to my office in City Hall. When you arrived at City Hall, uh, do you recall seeing any uh, video images or footage of this event? Um, the first time that I saw a video of the event um, was after I was notified that um, Mr. Floyd uh, had now been, was now deceased. And so I had asked uh, my deputy chief to pull up what I, knowing the area really well and knowing that there's usually a camera, a city-owned camera uh, at that location, I asked him to uh, locate that video so that I could review it. And it, that's what we would refer to as the milestone camera, or milestone footage? That is correct. Did you watch the footage from the milestone camera that evening? I did watch that. Okay. Can you describe for the jury what you saw when you watched the footage? Um, when I first viewed this milestone video, um, what I was able to see, 
And I should just note that um, it was from a distance uh, from where the officers were with Mr. Floyd. And so all I could really see were the back sides of the officers. Uh, there was also no audio uh, to this milestone video. And so um, I viewed that video uh, in its entirety. And uh, quite frankly, there was really nothing in terms of the actions of, of at least, again, this non-audio video that really jumped out at me. Uh, after a few minutes, it, it seemed, um, a paramedic's vehicle pulled up to the scene. And it was at that time for the first time that I uh, saw a glimpse of Mr. Floyd when paramedics placed him, placed his body on the gurney and um, uh, transported him away from the scene. Uh, but that was really uh, my first uh, observation of that incident from that, from that night. At some point, did you become aware of another video that had been taken by a bystander? Yes, uh, uh, probably close to midnight, a community member had contacted me and said, uh, Chief, uh, almost verbatim, but said, Chief, have you seen the video of your officer choking and killing that, that man? at 38th in Chicago. And so once I heard um, that statement, I just knew it wasn't the same milestone camera video uh, that I had saw. And um, eventually, within minutes after that, I saw for the first time uh, what is now known as the, uh, the bystander video. Fair to say that this was a much uh, closer video and it had audio? Yes, this um, I was able to see the occurrence, see um, the, the officers involved. Um, I was able to actually see Mr. Floyd. I was actually able to hear um, what was occurring. And um, I was also able to get a better understanding of the length of time, the duration of the call, the incident. Yes. Now, uh, prior to testifying today, have you now reviewed the bystander video, Facebook video in its entirety? Yes, I have. You've also reviewed and re reviewed milestone footage? Yes, I have. And have you reviewed the body-worn camera uh, footage worn by officers Tao, King, Lane, and the defendant? Yes, I have. Now, uh, First, uh, I want to show you what's been received as Exhibit 17. Do you recognize Exhibit 17 to be an image taken from the bystander video that you reviewed? Yes, I do. Now, sir, uh, based upon your review of all of the information that you just mentioned, um, do you believe that the defendant followed Dep departmental policy 5-304 regarding de-escalation? I absolutely do not agree with that. And how so? Um, that action um, is not de-escalation. And when we talk about uh, the framework of our sanctity of life, and when we talk about the principles and values that we have, that that action um, goes contrary to uh, to what we're taught. As you reflect on Exhibit 17, I must ask you: Is this a trained Minneapolis Police Department defensive tactics technique? It is not. Well, we read the uh, departmental policy on neck restraints. Is this a neck restraint? Um, the conscious neck restraint by policy mentions light to moderate pressure. When I look at Exhibit 17 um, and when I look at the facial expression of, of, of Mr. Floyd, that does not appear in any way, shape, or form that that is light to moderate pressure. So is it your belief then that this particular 
uh, form of restraint, if that's what you, if that's what we'll call it, uh, uh, in fact violates departmental policy. I absolutely agree that violates our policy. Are you aware now that the defendant maintained this position on George Floyd for nine minutes and 29 seconds? I am aware of that. I believe you testified that force has to be reasonable when it's applied at the beginning and through the entire encounter. Is that right? That is correct. Is what you see in Exhibit 17, in your opinion, within Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy 5-300 authorizing the use of reasonable force? It is not. And why not? That is, that is, uh, it has to be objectively reasonable. We have to take into account uh, the circumstances, information, the threat to the officer, the threat to others, um, and we, um, the severity of that. Uh, so that is not uh, part of our policy. That is not what we teach, and uh, that should be condoned. When do you believe or do you have a belief as to when this restraint, the restraint on the ground that you viewed, should have stopped? Once Mr. Floyd, and this is based on my viewing of the, the, the videos, um, once Mr. Floyd had stopped resisting, and certainly once he was um, uh, in distress and trying to verbalize that, um, that, that should have stopped. Um, there's, there's an initial reasonableness in trying to just get him under control over the, in the first few seconds, but, but uh, once there was no longer any resistance, and clearly when Mr. Floyd was no longer responsive and even motionless, to continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. Sir, based on your review of the video and based on your own experience and training as an MPD officer, did you see signs during the encounter that Mr. Floyd was exhibiting um, indicia of being in medical distress? Yes. Yes. And you saw at one point, I think you just testified that Mr. Floyd was unresponsive. That is correct. And uh, that officers, were you aware that officers couldn't find a pulse? Could you repeat that, sir? And were you aware that officers at the time of the restraint were unable to find a pulse? Yes, I was aware of that. And so stated. I was aware that the officers were not able to find a pulse, yes. Did you see the defendant uh, or any of the officers attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd? I did not see any of the defendants try to attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd. The defendant did not try CPR. He did not start chest compressions. Objection, uh, Sustain is leading. Rephrase. Did you see them? Prov did you see them provide any medical attention? I did not. Then, based on Lily's observations, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether the defendant violated MPD departmental policy 7-350 by failing to render aid to Mr. Floyd? I, I agree that uh, the defendant violated our policy in terms of rendering aid. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. If you could please take me. Mr. Nelson.
Good afternoon, Chief Arredondo. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon, Counselor. Thank you for being here this afternoon and this morning. Thank you. Um, a few follow-up questions for you regarding uh, this incident. Your, deter your determinations today are in reference to employment policies uh, and via Mr. Chauvin's actions violating the departmental employment policies, correct? That is correct. Now, as the police chief, I assume that you're not out on the street day to day arresting people. That is correct. Can you just give me a general sense? When's the last time that you've actually, I don't mean to be dismissive, but actually arrested a suspect? It's been many years, sir. Yeah. Yes. Your, your role as the Minneapolis police chief is sort of grander in its scope, right? I mean, it's... It's, it's um, large in context and, and uh, the operations of the uh, department, yes. And part of that job is to be sort of aware of issues in policing, kind of policy changes, use of force changes, all of these things under fall under the umbrella of your role as the chief. Agreed? Yes. And you're, you're sort of the general in a sense, right? Formulating the, the plan for your police department. And, and delegating some of those to our, our subject matter experts, yes. Correct. Um, when you talk about training of a police officer, you would also include um, the, the training that the Minneapolis Police Department uh, goes through, but you may go to other trainings out, out of state, listen to speakers talking about issues that confront policing, right? Yes. As well as maybe a homicide detective will get permission to travel to a, an interviewing a suspect type of a training in some other state or location, right? Yes. And so there's, there is a variability within the training depending upon your role as a, in, uh, in the police department, right? Yes. So the, you've got sort of your rank and file basic patrol officers and they go through all of the trainings that you've described, the defensive tactics, medical assistance or basic uh, medical training, um, crisis intervention, things that we've been talking about here today, right? Yes. And then the investigative type officers, they might, may go to some addition, they have to go through that training, but they may go through some additional training in terms of how to interview suspects or how to properly collect evidence, et cetera, unique to their role, right? Yes. And then you as the police chief or those who are in the more management or administrative side of the police department, you go to the, the kind of the big picture uh, training sometimes. That, that's correct. All right. Um, so I want to review with you um, a few of the policies that we've already talked about today. If we could turn, take this down for the moment, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I'd like to show you what has been introduced as Exhibit 216, 216 which is the use of force policy uh, for the City of Minneapolis Police Department. Yes. We've discussed this. And I know that kind of what we did a little earlier is we kind of jumped around from part to part, but I'd like to walk through some of these issues uh, in a little bit more linear fashion if we could. So you've described um, under policy 5-301.01 that the Fourth Amendment's reasonableness standard applies to the use of force in Minneapolis, uh, of the Minneapolis Police Department, agreed? Yes. And that goes on to say that MPD employees shall only use the amount of force that is objectively reasonable and it continues in light of the facts and circumstances known to that employee at the time the force is used, correct? Yes. So the reasonableness standard or the objectively reasonable standard applies to the facts and circumstances that are known by the officer at the time the force is being used, correct? Yes. 
Now, 5-302 gives some definitions in terms of uh, the use of force, and it differentiates between active aggression and active resistance. Can you describe the difference between active resistance, excuse me, active aggression and active resistance? Um, active aggression, uh, behavior initiated by the subject uh, that may or may not uh, be in response to police efforts to bring the person to custody or control. Uh, the act of aggression when presenting behaviors that constitute an assault or in the circumstances reasonably indicate that an assault or an injury to any person is likely to occur at any moment. That's so for me, active aggression. Yep, let me just stop you there. That's active aggression. So that's where a suspect is essentially fighting with a police officer or doing something that is aggressive behaviorally speaking. Agreed? Yes. And that, that is aggressive in its nature. Yes. Now, can you read active resistance? Uh, active resistance is a response to police efforts to bring a person into custody or control for detainment or arrest. Uh, subject engages in active resistance when engaging in physical actions or verbal behavior reflecting an intention to make it more difficult for officers to achieve actual physical control. So essentially what we're talking about here is behavior that may or may not be physical in its nature that simply makes it harder for an officer to take a person into custody, agreed? Yes. And sometimes that is maybe not uh, trying to punch the officer, but pulling away or hiding his arms or doing something that just makes it more difficult physically, right? Yes. And sometimes it's, you're not gonna take me alive, you dirty cop, you know? Like they're saying something uh, to, to prevent the officer from arresting, yes. right? So they're using their words, they're using their behaviors. Is it common, based upon your experience, for people to enjoy being taken into custody? Do people, no. do people like to be arrested? Typically not. Right. No. And in your experience, is it common practice for, for people who are being arrested to say things in an effort to try to get the officer to not arrest them? That certainly occurs, yes. Right. My mom is homesick, I need to get home to my kids. There may be words that they use to try to convince an officer to not arrest them, right? Yes. Now you would also agree that there is a difference between being arrested and being detained, agreed? There can be, right. yes. So an officer in certain circumstances is permitted to uh, expand the scope of the original intervention. Would you agree with that? Objection made. You can restate. Let me, let me try. Yeah. When an officer um, approaches a situation, and it, let's assume it's a, a relatively minor offense, is it possible that that minor offense can grow in its scope of investigation? Yes. And it's actually quite common for that to happen, correct? Yes. An officer makes a traffic stop for speeding or something like that, smells drugs in the car, searches the car, finds a large amount of drugs, finds guns, etc. right? Yes. So what starts out as a relatively minor incident, a traffic ticket, can turn into a felony arrest, correct? It could. And that, again, happens quite regularly. Yes. So... When an officer, well, let me back up a second. You would agree that being a police officer is a pretty dangerous profession. Um, there are inherent dangers with it. Um, I've never had to get in a fight with anybody in my life, in, in my job, right? But in your job, it's probably more probable that that will happen. Would you yes. agree with that? Now, Talking about the use of force, when an officer approaches a motor vehicle, is that considered to be one of the most dangerous um, initiations of contact between an officer and a citizen? Um, I don't have the um, exact statistics on it. It's certainly um, an encounter that officers are certainly more heightened. Um, I, I know that domestic response calls can also have a sense of heightened awareness for officers, um, but it's certainly something, a, a traffic stop certainly 
raises an awareness for officers, yes, for their safety. And that's because um, that's that suspect's sort of space, right? The officer doesn't know what's in the car or in the apartment during a domestic situation. You're walking into someone else's territory, so to speak, right? Uh, um, yes. Right. And so there could be guns, there could be knives, there could be any number of instruments that could bring harm to a police officer, right? There's that potential. Now, obviously, there's tens of thousands of traffic stops, and there's not, not every traffic stop turns violent. I'm not suggesting that, but that does happen regularly. Agreed? That the traffic stops turn violent. Uh, yes, they can. So when we're talking about the use of force policy under 5-301.01, the last sentence that wasn't read before is the force used shall be consistent with current MPD training. Agreed? Yes. Now there's a difference between a policy change and like a best practice change. Would you agree with that? Can you clarify? Sure. So there are certain times where the policy, it's with respect to the use of force, may specifically change to prohibit a particular style or use of force, right? Yes. So thinking about in the old days, officers used to wear like weighted gloves to make their punches more effective, right? Yes. The policy changed and prohibited that, correct? Yes. And then there's a difference between, say, the evolution of defensive tactics. Would you agree with that? I mean, the, the, tr the defensive yeah. tactics training you received in 1989 was much different than the defensive tactics training that's taught now, right? Yes. And I believe it was maybe 15 years ago uh, that the Minneapolis Police Department started moving towards more body weight control, sort of this jujitsu uh, training as opposed to physically striking people to gain compliance. And are you referencing policy or, or training? Training. I believe so. About 15, 10, 15 years ago, agreed? Yes. And that was sort of highlighting the evolution, as you kind of described it in your direct examination, of policing since you've become a police officer. That's yes. one way it's evolved. Yes. And when something changes per policy, can't wear weighted gloves anymore, for example, that's it, no more. Agreed? Yes, I agree, yes. But if the policy, if, if training, for example, evolves into a best practice, it doesn't prevent an officer from learning a, a technique he learned earlier in his career. Just may not be the best practice anymore. So I, I pause just to, when you say that they're learning something, but if it's, if it's not in alignment with our policy, then that would not be prohibited. If, if, if I'm well, hearing so you correctly. Let me, let me try to explain. Like, so if an officer was trained in a particular handcuffing technique and then they go to their defensive tactics training and they say, this is a better way to handcuff a suspect, it's not a policy change, it's just a best practice change. And they can still use the old way they did it. Uh, it would, uh, Counselor, it would, it would have to be something that the training staff would have to, uh, not just an officer saying, I want to do it this way, and I mean, it's something that would have to be authorized through our, our training right. so, staff. Yes. So we could talk about that kind of thing with the training, the use of force defensive tactics training, right? That would be the better place to talk, to better people to talk to about that? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Now, when we're talking about active aggression and active resistance, sometimes those two things are happening simultaneously. Agreed? It can be, yes. So now we were talking then about, um, again, the Graham versus Connor case. 
and how that is incorporated into the Minneapolis Police Department policy. And I'm showing you Exhibit 217 now. It should be up in front of you. What we're basically talking about was a United States Supreme Court decision that, that outlined the objectively reasonable use of force standard, right? Yes. And Graham versus Connor is not limited to those three factors that you were read before, right? The Graham versus Connor analysis. Yes, correct. Those are three that are kind of listed, but ultimately it's not an all-inclusive list of considerations for the reasonableness of the use of force. Agreed? That would be my understanding, yes. And in fact, what the policy reads is that the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of the reasonable officer on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight, right? Yes. So we're looking at it in the instant and the moment based upon the objective standard, right? Yes. Now it also, the policy also includes that the calculus of reasonableness must embody allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation, right? Yes. And that's because when officers go to a situation, kind of like what we talked about before, what can be very initially very minor can grow into something major. Agreed? Yes. Now we like to show you exhibit 219. You read um, a part of 5 304, which is threatening the use of force and de escalation. And I want to talk to you a little bit about de escalation. Um, Have you heard the term, sometimes you have to escalate to de-escalate? You ever heard that phrase? I have not heard that. Okay. So in here you talk about, or the policy talks about, um, that officers shall consider verbally announcing their intent to use force, including displaying an authorized weapon as a threat of force, right? So sometimes an officer has to take out his gun say, hey, I mean, that's a, that's a use of force in that instance, right? Yes. And if you don't listen to me, you know, I'm going to use force. It's a pretty clear indication that force could be used when you have a gun pointing at you. Would you agree with that? Yes. But other things such as chemical irritants or tasers, it's not limited to just the firearm, right? Yes. And so sometimes what, you have, what an officer has to do is command the presence, right? They have to take control of the situation. Yes. And sometimes that's not particularly attractive, is it? Could you explain? Sure. Uh, the use of force is not something that people like to watch generally, right? Objection, speculation, and argument. Sustained. Would you agree that the use of force is not an attractive notion? I would say that um, use of force is something that um, most officers would rather not use, yes. Right. And you described in your direct examination how the single greatest way that the Minneapolis Police Department could be judged is based upon how the public perceives its use of force. Yes. Right? So it, it has a tendency to garner a lot of attention. It can. So much so that citizens have become more um, prone to record observed interactions with police, right? Yes. Something that you didn't have to deal with back in 1989, right? Yes. So essentially what this policy 5-304 in terms of threatening the use of force, it's contained within this de-escalation concept, right? So sometimes you have to display a weapon to gain command so that you can de-escalate, right? Yes. 
Now when we're talking about, is it fair to say that pretty much every single one of these use of force of policies contains some phrase, if reasonable or if practical, there's limitations on the use of force, right? Yes, there are limitations, yes. And, there, and it's situation by situation, right? Yes. And then again, if we go back and look at the language of the Graham versus Connor and the policy that's contained by Minneapolis Police Department, it's uh, the use of force has no precise objective singular rule. It's different in every case. Yes. So the, the for example, in the de-escalation policy 5-304B1, de-escalation is advisable when it is safe and feasible, correct? Yes. And sometimes de-escalation, again, includes the use of force, right? The use of force can be a de-escalation tactic. I was in counselor. I was thinking of your example of displaying your 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 weapon, and so I don't have a, a lot of knowledge in terms of physical force being used to actually de-escalate a situation, uh, but the threatening use of force or threatening verbally. Right. That's I'm more familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. So again, if we were to talk to the use of force or defensive tactics, Objection. argumentative, overall. They would be the best source of that. Overruled. Yes. But the purpose of de escalation, agreed, is to attempt to slow down or stabilize the situation so that more time, options, and resources become available to the officer. Yes. Basically, slow down, everybody kind of calm down, let's try to relax, right? Yes. But it's a lot more, the, de the process of de-escalation is not just trying to talk somebody out of doing something. There are actions that are important. There may be reactions that are important. And the, and the de-escalation policy includes some examples of those things, right? Yes. Such as placing barriers between an uncooperative subject and an officer. Yes. And sometimes those barriers are another officer, right? Yes containing a threat, right? I mean, that's one of the examples in the in policy. Yes. By containing a threat, that can include physically restraining someone so that they don't upset another person, right? Yes. Or cause another person to have a violent reaction towards them or officers, right? Yes. Moving from a position that exposes officers to potential threats to a safer position, right? So kind of retreating in certain circumstances. Yes. Reducing exposure to a potential threat using distance, cover, or concealment, right? So hiding, say, behind a squad car, right? Yes. Avoiding physical confrontation. That's, a, that's probably a pretty big one, right? Yes. And using verbal techniques uh, to calm an agitated subject or promote rational decision-making. That's kind of down towards the end. Yes. And lastly, calling additional resources. Right? Yes. And we talked about... Um, Showing you Exhibit 230, which is the emergency medical response. We agree that the policy requires Minneapolis police employees to request an emergency medical service as soon as practical, right? Yes if a person comes into contact having an acute medical crisis and any delay in treatment could potentially aggravate the severity of the, of the 
uh, medical crisis, right? Yes. So sometimes officers will call for EMS, not thinking it's a major issue. When suddenly it becomes apparent, they can step up or request a quicker response from EMS, right? Yes. And that is something that an officer can do to m ensure the medical treatment of uh, the suspect that they have or the person that they're in, in contact with, right? Uh, Counselor, to, to ensure, I'm sorry, to ensure. <clears throat> sorry, it's been a long week. To ensure the um, medical condition of the suspect, to help with that. Yes. Right. Get EMS there as quickly as is possible. Right? Yes. Now we didn't talk a little. We didn't talk about the maximal restraint uh, technique. You're familiar with the policies surrounding that. Yes. I'm going to show to you what's been admitted as Exhibit Two Two Five. Can you describe what the maximal restraint technique is? Yes, uh, Counselor. The the maximal restraint technique is uh, has often been referred to as uh, the hobble, and. That is a, um, it's a method of if officers are dealing with a, uh, typically a combative or aggressive person in order to protect them or even property, uh, it's placing, uh, basically attaching a, um, uh, a cord of the legs to the waist to, so that the person, the individual, um, does not have free movement of their legs. Uh, so it's securing them, again, for, usually by their ankles. Uh, if you're prone, bringing that up to your waist and securing it. Um, the maximal restraint technique or the hobble, though, um, if it's used, a supervisor has to respond to the scene. Uh, you cannot transport anyone prone in that position due to the risks of um, uh, the breathing. Uh, and so. But that is the uh, counselor, that would be my understanding of the MRT or the maximal restraint technique. So you talked a little bit in terms of the use of force, how officers are kind of reevaluating their use of force from time to time, right? They yes. should be at least, right? And so if officers decide to use the maximal restraint technique and then decide, hey, we know, or and then later decide not to use it, right, that is kind of adjusting that use of force. I would, Counselor, with, with some, some clarity, um, I don't know if that, what I, what I mean by that is if you were to have a person handcuffed and prone on their stomach on the ground and pavement and you had two officers, let's say, securing their legs to the back of the waist, you in a way are still imploring employing what that technique is about anyway so um so th there, there can be some variances to that sure if that makes sense it does so let's assume that you've got two officers pulling the legs forward essentially employing that uh, aversion so to speak of the maximal restraint but then they release and they say we're not gonna we're not gonna hobble this person we're not gonna employ the mrt you're going from a decision to employ that technique backwards down this, the continuum in terms of the use of force. Would you agree with that? And, and Counselor, I just, just, because these, these types of uses of force can be problematic in terms of there's a high risk to them. So meaning that um, if you're going to take that initiative to do that alternative version in the first place, um, you'd want to get a hold of a supervisor because something could happen in terms of that that uh, that person, and so I'm not I just wanted, yeah. I'm not asking in terms of the policy. I'm asking in terms of sort of the the use of force and the critical decision making model, right? You you described how the use of force you have to go through this critical decision making model. How much force am I going to use? And sometimes you have to back off the use of force. Agreed? Yes. And sometimes you have to go forward with the use of force, meaning you use even more force. Yes. Right? And it's a, this constant reevaluation. 
Agreed? Yes. And so when you have officers who make a decision that the, the facts and circumstances would warrant using the hobble device, but then later decide not to employ that device, that is that critical decision-making model in action. Agreed? Yes. And it would be a reduction in the use of force. It may still require supervisors to be on scene policy-wise, but it is a reduction in the use of force. Agreed? And Councilor, just are we talking specifically the events of May 25th? I'm talking or generally. In general, yes. But you would agree ultimately that all of the Minneapolis Police Department policies relevant to the use of force, emergency medical uh, response, uh, emergency medical treatment, all of these policies are, by their very language, are situationally dependent, right? They all say if the circumstances allow, if time permits, if it's safe. They have a qualifier to them. Agreed? Yes, I'd agree with that. I'll show you Exhibit 231. Which is at the at the bottom of Exhibit 231 is the crisis intervention uh, policy, and the second page includes the definition. Could you read the entire definition of what a crisis is? Uh, yes, uh, an event or situation where an individual's safety and health are threatened by behavioral health challenges to include mental illness, developmental disabilities, substance use, or overwhelming stressors. A crisis can involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the individual's current resources and coping mechanisms and may include unusual stress in his or her life that renders him or her unable to function as he or she normally would. The crisis may, but not necessarily, result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to himself, herself, and or others. All right, so generally speaking, again, not relevant to the May 25th of 2020 incident, we'll get there in a minute, but when we talk about a, a general police response, Sometimes the police may respond to something and the person they're dealing with is not in a crisis. Agreed? Yes. But other people may be perceiving what is happening and it could become a crisis to that person. Objection. Could you, if you could rephrase. Sure. People who observe, uh, would you say that people who observe police interactions with people, especially the more physical or use of force types, that's a, that could turn into a crisis for an observer? Objection irrelevant? Sustain is calling for speculation. So in terms of the definition of crisis, a crisis may involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds that individual's current resources and coping mechanisms, right? Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are, res the person with whom you are arresting or having contact with is going to be the person who will experience the crisis. Agreed? Overruled. Um. And Councilor, I just respectfully, so you're, you're saying that the person who's witnessing a situation with the officers, that situation may cause them to be in crisis? Correct. Could potentially. Right. And the crisis may, but not necessarily, result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to him, her, or others, right? And counselor, just uh, this is the person who's who's watching this, right? It could. Right. So people are watching what 
something that they appear to believe or they believe is wrong or contrary to police policy that may cause them to get upset and that level of upset or that level of volatility may grow throughout the course of the interaction. Objection, irrelevant, calls for speculation and beyond the scope. Well, it's within the scope. It, it could. Right. Because ultimately part of the training that Minneapolis police officers have to go through is how to deal with crowds who observe police interactions, right? Yes. Crowds that may be upset with police interaction, right? Yes. I mean, there, there are classes through the training academy, there are classes through in-service, specifically dealing with how to deal with crowd control, right? Yes. And all of this is to revert in part back to that de-escalation process as well, right? Yes. So part of it as a crowd grows or becomes more upset, part of it is to try to de-escalate, which can involve trying to avoid a physical constant confrontation, right? Yes, it could. Yes. Trying to stay safe, concealed, and covered, right? Yes. Not yelling back at somebody, not engaging in them with them verbally, right? Yes. And sometimes when an officer tries to de-escalate a situation and someone is so upset, right, sometimes they don't hear what the officer tells them. Would you agree with that? Objection, speculation. That calls for speculation. It is sustained. Is it possible, generally speaking, that someone's own crisis may prevent them from hearing what an officer is telling them? That could happen. The, hold on. The objection is sustained. The answer will be stricken. So you, you, you testified that uh, you've watched the body cameras, correct? Yes. going to show you, I don't know, Mr. Slisher, this is uh, Exhibit 1008, which is a 10 second, approximately 5 second clip of Alexander King's uh, body worn camera that's already in, in, and I gave you a copy of it. Is this in evidence? Not yet, no. I'm just telling you, first and foremost, that's what it is. I'm going to show you on your screen uh, a short clip of a video to see if this would be contained in the, what you've watched. And I need to... Do you would agree that that appears to be taken from one of the officer's body cameras uh, May 25th, 2020, at approximately 20, 25, and 33 seconds. Yes. In again, watching it without sound. Do you, uh, at this point, did you see a, what appear to be someone's a reflection in the back of a squad car there? Uh, Counselor, I did, I did not. Okay. And it might just be because of the brevity of the video. But. Yeah, it's unfortunate. If you look in the upper left-hand corner at the bumper of the squad video. The cursor to circle it for him. I'm sorry? Use the, cur the cursor or the stylus to... Oh, sure. That's right. I forgot all this fancy technology here. see the legs of someone in reflecting? Yes. And so you would uh, agree that this appears to be a short clip from one of the officer's body-worn cameras on May 25th of 2020? Yes. You've seen these before. You see what appears to be Mr. Floyd's arm 
uh, there by the back of the squat cut, right? Yes. So I would offer exhibit 1008. Any objection? No objection. 1008 is received. And if I may publish. <coughs> Come over here. I'm up, I'm up on the sidewalk. To, yeah, we need you to, we need you to keep some distance. Yeah, Sorry, I didn't mean to reply. Do you hear our voice say we've got an ambulance coming? Yes. Oops, sorry, if we could take that down. Now, uh, policy 5-311, let's talk a little bit about 5-311, which is the neck restraint policy. This. Council, would you stand there for a second? Sure. Good time to break for our 20 minute mid afternoon break. We'll reconvene around 3.20. Thank you.
Right. Chief, another reminder, you're still under oath. Yes. Yeah. All right. We, uh, before the break, we were going to be talking about um, the neck, use of neck restraints and the policies that permitted neck restraints. That is Minneapolis Police Policy 5-311, correct? Yes. Right. Exhibit 224, you have that in front of you there? Yes. So there are, uh, is a difference, the policy draws a difference between a chokehold and a neck restraint, correct? Yes. A chokehold is actually from the front obstructing or occluding the trachea and airway of the suspect, correct? Yes. And per Minneapolis policy, that's considered a lethal use of force or a deadly use of force, right? Yes. And that's because it has a high rate of death associated with it, right? That is correct. It's more dangerous to, to from the front. Yes. It also differentiates between a chokehold and a neck restraint, agreed? Yes. And a neck restraint is specifically defined as compressing one or both sides of a person's neck with an arm or leg without applying direct pressure to the trachea or airway. Agreed? Um, based upon the policy, I, I think it's important to note, Counselor, that the light to moderate pressure. Is well. Right. Understood. Yeah. Light to moderate pressure. Yes. And I'm assuming that you don't have a degree in physics. I do not, Counselor. Okay. And in terms of the amount of pressure or force that was actually applied to Mr. Floyd, you would not be qualified to speak to that. Agreed? Agreed. <clears throat> but then it, it also differentiates between a conscious and an unconscious neck restraint, right? Yes. And a conscious neck restraint is where you have someone who is resisting you and you apply that neck restraint in an effort to simply gain control of that person but they stay conscious, correct? Yes. And an unconscious neck restraint is where you actually render the subject unconscious, right? Yes. Both were permitted under Minneapolis police policy on May 25th of 2020, agreed? Yes. And ultimately, uh, you have, if I understand what you have, the opinion that you have formed, you have formed the opinion that this was a neck restraint that was being employed. Yes. <clears throat> and you have also formed the opinion that this was an unconscious neck restraint. Is that correct? Or excuse me, a conscious neck restraint. Yes. Okay. You're familiar, you testified on direct examination that uh, it is contrary to the training that you've received to place your neck or your knee on a subject's neck. Counselor, if I can clarify, um, it is contrary to our training to indefinitely place um, your knee on a prone, handcuffed individual for an indefinite period of time. For So the issue that you take with it is the length of time? Counselor, the, there's a couple of issues, and, and one of those, again, is, uh, as you've noted, uh, receiving the information. Um, is the person a threat to the officers or others? What is the severity of the crime? Uh, are you reevaluating and assessing the person's medical condition? So all of that critical thinking, um, that's, so that's really key for me in terms of why I vehemently disagree that that was the appropriate use of force for that situation okay. on May 25th. Now, when we talk about that crit critical decision-making model, that critical decision-making model doesn't only apply to the specific subject that you have under your control, correct? And Counselor, just and so we're talking about, is this the bystanders? Would you mind moving the microphone back just a little? Your Honor, my apologies. 
Uh, no problem. I think we just Could get a, got a loud voice. Sorry. Sorry. Well, I'm, I, yeah, I'm talking about bystanders. I'm talking about other officers. I'm talking about other things that come into play in terms of the officer's critical decision making. And I apologize, Counselor, if you could just re rephrase that question sure. again. When an officer is engaged in the use of force, and I'll just phrase it as a yes or no, their attention is not exclusively necessarily focused on the subject of, of for whom they have in custody. Agreed? Or disagree. The officer that the counselor, the officer that is gauging in the use of force may be viewing other other matters? Correct. That would be yes. Right. And in fact, that's what the, the de escalation model talks about is looking at things from a tactical advantage or disadvantage. Agreed? It's one of the portions of it. Right. Specifically in the policy de-escalation has to be applied assuming that it's safe to do so, right? Yes. And all other tactical considerations, agreed? That's what the policy says. Yes. And in terms of that, those decision-making, an officer, it's not a singular decision-making process that's happening in the course of an arrest, agreed? Yes. So an officer has to be concerned about other things that are known to him at that time. Agreed? Yes. So some of those things would be, what just happened between me and this subject a few minutes ago, right? Yes. I just fought with this subject a few minutes ago. I'm talking generally here. I just thought with, fought with this person generally a few minutes ago. He now seems to be not resisting, but that doesn't mean he can't resist again, right? Yes even if he's handcuffed, right? Yes. And so even if he's handcuffed, someone can still, pres they, they're not threatless if they're handcuffed. Agreed? And Counselor, this is just a general, general hypothetical. Right. Uh, yes. Right. Someone who is handcuffed can be equally as, as a threat to an officer as someone who's not handcuffed. Yes. They can kick and they could bite they can spit, they can do all sorts of things, agreed? Yes. Now, in terms of the use, so I just want to make sure you form the opinion that this was a conscious, an, excuse me, an unconscious neck restraint, right? A uh, counselor? In the, on May 25th of 2020. That it was a conscious neck restraint? Conscious neck restraint. Yes. Okay. Now. Again, in this whole de-escalation, officers have to take into consideration the safety of the crowd, right? Yes. They have to take into account the reactions of the crowd, whether they're angry or hostile or just simply watching, right? Yes. That's all part of this critical decision-making model, right? Yes. They have to be aware of their surroundings, right? Generally yes. speaking. Being on a busy street versus being on a, in a park, right? Yes. Different decision go into that, right? Yes. Knowing that I have other officers that are in place and may be at risk as well, right? Yes. So there's lots of, the, the critical decision making model is not singular in its application. That's correct. Lots of information coming in very rapidly, right? Yes. So I'm going to show you first, and I believe by stipulation, or at least without objection, I'm going to play a few minutes, or excuse me, a few seconds of Ms. Frazier's Facebook video. Uh, so at this time, I'd offer Exhibit 1018. No objection. Uh, permission Ten, to publish. 1018 is received. You may publish. Sorry. This appears to be sort of that time, that picture that was shown to you earlier, Exhibit 19. This is that general time, uh, time frame that that picture appears to be taken from. Counselor, yes. I'm sorry. Was that here? That's the question. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. This, uh, this appears to be that, that image you were shown on direct examination, that static Exhibit 19, right? Yes. 
shows Officer Chauvin, shows Officer Flo or excuse me, Mr. Floyd, it shows Officer Tao. Yes. And it shows the perspective of the of the um, Miss Frazier's phone. Chief, are you um, familiar with the concept of camera perspective bias? I am not, Counselor. Okay. Now again, if I may take that down, by stipulation, I'm going to show that same time frame, exhibit 2000, excuse me, 1019, that same perspective from Mr. King's body camera, and I'd offer 1019. 1019. Any objection? No objection. 1019 is received. <laughs> Wish to publish your own. Agree it appears to be the same time frame? Yes. All right. Now, lastly, Chief, I'm going to show you one last video. We can take this down, Your Honor. Exhibit, I would offer Exhibit 1020, which is a side by side of the two. Any objection? No objection. 1020 is received. And permission to publish. Just start it over, if that's okay. You would agree, Chief, that from the perspective of Miss Frazier's camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee is on the neck of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Would you agree that from the perspective of Officer King's body camera, it appears that Officer Chauvin's knee was more on Mr. Floyd's shoulder blade? Um, yes. I have no further questions. Mr. Slusher. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Chief, let's start um, with what you just saw and you testified that the, the particular moment in time uh, that you were viewing Officer King or former Officer King's body worn camera, it appeared at that moment in time that the knee of the defendant was more toward the shoulder blade, is that right? That is correct. That was at a time where the ambulance had already arrived? Yes. Very shortly before they loaded Mr. Floyd onto the gurney? Is that, that, right? is, that is correct. And in your view of the body-worn camera uh, footage and everything you reviewed prior to testifying today, did you see uh, the defendant's knee uh, anywhere but the neck of Mr. Floyd up until that time? That is correct. And so the knee of Mr. F of the defendant was on Mr. Floyd's neck up until the time you just pointed out. Yes, uh, when I viewed that video portion, um, that is the first time that I'd seen uh, the knee of the defendant on the shoulder blade area. And that was right before the paramedic came? That is correct. Now, looking at uh, and talking about the uh, neck restraint policy, if you would show Exhibit 17, please. Oh. So looking at Exhibit 17, was it your testimony that Exhibit 17 is not a trained MPD neck restraint? Correct, that is my testimony. And I'd like you to reflect on the exhibits that you were shown by defense counsel, exhibits 1008, 1019, and 1020, the, the 10 second clip. Okay. During that period of time, which is you know much later than the point in time we see here, uh, did you see any indication that Mr. Floyd was actively resisting, as that term is defined in Minneapolis Police Department policy. I, I did not um, observe Mr. Floyd to be actively resisting during that time. Did you uh, see, same question, same time period, any indication that Mr. Floyd was being actively aggressive during that 10 second clip that you were just shown? No, I did not observe Mr. Floyd to be actively aggressive during that could you, short video. Could you even say that he was passively resisting at that time that you were shown those exhibits? No, as a matter of fact, as I saw that video, um, I didn't even know if Mr. Floyd was alive at that time. I want to revisit a little bit of the testimony uh, on cross-examination about the use of the MRT or the hobble, right? And if I'm to understand your testimony, you indicated that um, a hobble is a strap that's used to connect a purse, a handcuffed person, their waist, the arms, and the legs to restrain them. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. And what I thought I heard you saying uh, in response to questioning by counsel was that you can use it, you can do an MRT effectively, right, without using a hobble when you're doing the same thing but with your hands. Yes, that is correct. And did I understand your testimony to essentially be that that's what these officers were doing was essentially using the maximal restraint technique but not using the hobble? That is correct. And pursuant to uh, departmental policy, the hobble is the only authorized use, of the only authorized way to employ the maximal restraint technique. Is that right? That is correct. Are you aware that the formal use, the use of the actual hobble requires uh, a supervisor to report to the scene and do a force report? Yes, the supervisor must uh, arrive at the scene and do a report. But uh, that would be avoided if the hobble itself wasn't used or? No, if you're still employing that sort of technique, again, with a prone individual handcuffed 
and you're, you're, you're basically doing that maneuver. Uh, and because of the severity of risk to, um, and certainly that would have been to Mr. Floyd, you would have contacted a supervisor. And, and uh, aside from that, I mean, if you're using an MRT, uh, you are supposed to adhere to departmental policy. Is that right? That is correct. And the de Minis uh, Minneapolis departmental policy for the use of the MRT requires an officer to do what as soon as the MRT is applied? Again, because of the severe nature of making sure that that individual can breathe, we have to get that individual into a side recovery position to make sure that their airway is not obstructed. And so that's, that's uh, paramount. So, and that's required by policy and the side recovery position uh, is supposed to be instant, is that right? Immediate. And the, you indicated that uh, it has to do with breathing. Are you you're familiar with the term positional asphyxia? I am. Is that one of the dangers of leaving somebody in a prone handcuffed position uh, for too long? Yes, positional asphyxia, we, we again, as I mentioned, we cannot transport people in that position if they're prone to handcuffed and there's pressure uh, around their airways or on their back. The, the risk and potential for them um, and us killing them goes up substantially. So that side recovery position is very critically important. I want to follow up on uh, some of the questions about your own personal training and that of different uh, officers in different roles within the Minneapolis Police Department. Different officers can attend uh, other types of training, is that right? Yes. But everybody's required to do in-service training, is that true? That is correct. And regardless of where somebody trains, I mean, the, the rules are the rules, right? Yes. And the policy applies to all MPD officers. Yes. The question was posed regarding the critical decision-making model and the need to take in information. And that's true, correct? Yes. Uh, when we're looking at the proper and authorized use of force under departmental policy, is it fair to say that the amount of force an officer can use depends upon the conduct of the subject, the person upon whom the force is being used? Yes, it's fair to say that. So for example, if you had me in, uh, let's say, uh, a, a dangerous hold, right? would you be able to continue to keep me in a dangerous hold based on something somebody else is doing? I'm sorry, if you could explain that, I'm sorry. So for example, if you found the need to place me in some sort of a hold, that's dangerous. Yes. Uh, but something that you see, say the judge is starting to pick something up to throw at me, would that justify you using more force on me? No. In terms of uh, de-escalating uh, the crowd, you indicated that there's some um, potential uh, need to de-escalate uh, a crowd, a group of people. Is that right? Yes. Uh, because a group of people can experience something that they find shocking uh, or upsetting, and that can you know, uh, place them in some kind of an emotional state. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, you may need to turn your attention to and de-escalate the crowd. Yes. Would one way, if we can show Exhibit 17, would one way to de-escalate the crowd who's experiencing something shocking to stop doing the thing that's shocking them? Absolutely. I have nothing further. Any recross? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, just one question. There are certain circumstances where an officer has to kind of freeze the situation, evaluate, hold the person until he or she can decide 
what's the safest way to move forward. Agreed? Agreed. Sometimes you just have to kind of hold the person, correct? Yes. And that's something that happens fairly frequently. Agreed? Yes. And so uh, one other question with respect to the policy regarding the maximal restraint technique and putting a person in the, the recovery position or the side recovery position, you said it was immediate. Agreed? As soon as you're able to do so, yes. Right. And that's actually what the policy says is as soon as you're able to do so, right? Yes. And there are certain circumstances under which you may be using force where the, the force has to be dealt with before you can turn your attention to rendering medical aid, right? And counsel, just so that, are we still talking about someone in the recovery position or in the hobble? Just or generally. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sure. There are certain circumstances where a use of force needs to be continued for some reason to deal with something else before you can uh, deal or render medical aid. Let me use, give you an example. Yeah. We're in a gun battle, right? You and I are shooting at each other. I'm the cop, you're the bad guy, and you hit my partner. I'm gonna continue to use my force against you before I can go you render medical aid. Counselor, in that hypothetical, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Briefly. Sometimes it's necessary to freeze a scene and to hold an individual, correct? Yes. But you have to do so safely. You have to hold the person safely. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Nothing further. All right. Thank you, Chief. You're Your excused. Honor, thank you so much. Next witness. All right. All right, next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Katie Blackwell. You swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to kill be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. And if you, if you don't mind taking off your mask, great. Uh, let's begin by having you state your full name and spell each of your names. Okay, Katie, K-A-T-I-E, Marie, M-A-R-I-E, Blackwell, B-L-A-C-K-W-E-L-L. -L. Mr. Slusher. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you employed? Uh, through the Minneapolis Police Department. What is your current position? My current position is the inspector of the 5th uh, Precinct. Right. How long have you been the inspector of the 5th Precinct? Since January 31st this year. What, were your immediate, what was your immediate uh, rank and assignment prior to that? The commander of the training division. Now, I'd like uh, you to tell the jury a little bit about yourself. First, uh, could you tell us about your educational background in law enforcement? Sure, so my two-year associate's degree is in uh, law enforcement through Minneapolis Community and Technical College. My four-year uh, bachelor degree is in police science through St. Mary's University. My master's degree is in uh, public safety administration 
from St. Mary's University. I'm a graduate of the Northwestern Police Staff and Command, and I'm just about to complete a two-year uh, course in United States Army Sergeant Majors Academy, which is equivalent to a master's in leader. Uh, so in addition to being a police officer, you're also in the Minnesota National Guard, is that right? I am. At, at what rank? E9 Sergeant Major. Okay. And uh, just for the uninitiated, can you describe where, uh, where that falls within the, the ranks of the enlisted? That is the top enlisted rank that you can achieve. How long have you been in the Minnesota National Guard? Uh, over 23 years. Have you ever deployed? I have. Where? Uh, to Bosnia on a peacekeeping mission, and then to Iraq for almost two years on a Operation Iraqi Freedom. Thank you. Can you please uh, tell the jury when you began uh, your law enforcement career with the Minneapolis Police Department? Uh, sure. So in uh, 1999, I worked with the 2nd Precinct Community Response Team in the neighborhood I grew up in, Northeast Minneapolis, and we basically worked on uh, nuisance livability crimes, narcotics-related, alcohol-related. And then in 2000, I became a community service officer. Um, I was assigned to the 4th Precinct in the SWAT team. In 2002, I became a police officer, and I worked the 1st uh, Precincts, 2nd Precinct, and 3rd Precinct, mostly 911 response patrol. I did um, work for 1st Precinct and 3rd Precinct's uh, community response team, which is, uh, I did a lot of ICE work and narcotics-related investigations. And then I uh, did a little time in the Violent Offender Task Force, which is known as Safe Streets. Um, that's high felony violent crimes that we worked. In uh, 2012, I was promoted to sergeant, uh, where I worked sex crimes investigations, and then 4th Precinct Patrol Supervisor, and then 1st Precinct Patrol Supervisor, mostly overseeing 911 response, and then our community response teams, and uh, foot patrol. And then I went to the assault unit to do investigations and then Violent Criminal Investigation Team, which was primarily investigating shootings, and then Cold Case Homicide and Homicide Detective. I was then promoted in December 2019 uh, to the rank of Lieutenant, and I should say during that time, I, I led the SWAT Crisis Negotiator Team for five out of the seven years. When I became a Lieutenant, I was assigned to the Training Division uh, to create leadership and professional development programs for the department, and then I, I took on the Field Training Officer Program I was promoted to commander of training in April 14th, 2019, where I oversaw uh, the Police Athletic League, Police Explorers, Community Service Officers, uh, the Academy, Police Academies, the in-service training, uh, overseeing the subject matter experts, uh, the medical support team, range uh, patrol operations, the crisis intervention team, and the use of force team, uh, as well as uh, recruitment, hiring background, the 911 call center, uh, court liaison and adult and vulnerable homeless population. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, as a person who was in uh, command of the uh, training center, uh, are you familiar with you know the basic curriculum that was offered at that center during the time period uh, you oversaw the operations? I was. And uh, were you also familiar with the various um, staff and components who provided training at that center? Yes. Uh, before we get into a, a more thorough description of the training center, I need to ask if you're familiar with an individual by the name of Derek Sh uh, Chauvin. I am. Yeah, how are you familiar with that person? Uh, well, we worked on the same shift. We were community service officers together. Back uh, prior to becoming a police officer? Correct. So you've known this person for approximately how long? Almost 20 years. Okay. Do you recognize uh, Derek Chauvin in the courtroom today? I do. Would you please point to him and describe what he's wearing? Uh, I was sitting over there in a navy blue uh, suit. May the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. Mm -hmm. It will. Now, you and the defendant have uh, worked for the Minneapolis Police Department contemporaneously for uh, nearly 20 years? Correct. When you came into the uh, uh, police department, did you go through academy training? I did. Hey, describe that process. It was a 16-week police academy uh, that we went through. Everything from we learned policy, procedure, investigations, um, defensive tactics, use of force, 
we did a lot of scenarios at the end um, that we had to pass. So it was just a wide curriculum of things, report writing, basically anything that pertained to the job. Okay. And after completing the, the classroom and practical portion of uh, the academy when you took it, what was the next step? Sorry? What was the next step after completing the, the practical uh, exercises at the academy and the classroom training? Oh, so it's a field training program. It's approximately five to six months long that you would ride with a field training officer. And then after you completed that, uh, you were able to get your first assignment? Correct. Well, I'd like you to please describe first uh, generally the training center. Where is it located uh, within Minneapolis? Sure. So it's uh, our training center is a former elementary school that's located on the north side of Minneapolis. And it's just several classrooms that we use for training, as well as uh, auditorium and a gym if we have to do hands-on or practical exercises. And it was supervised at the commander level or is supervised at the commander level? It is. Can you then describe, you know, currently or at least at the time uh, of, say, 2020, uh, when you were overseeing it, how is it staffed or the different uh, positions at the training center? So this, there's multiple units out of the Special Operations Center is the, the training facility. Uh, for the training, we had full-time instructors, our use of force um, instructors, our patrol operations, our medical support team. Our civilian uh, support staff, we have two civilian support staff members. Uh, we were, I don't know if you want me to go through the rank structure, but. I do, how many lieutenants were under? At the time there was three lieutenants. Okay. In, what, in what areas? So one oversaw uh, pre-service, so your academies, and then another one oversaw the use of force program and uh, our range. And then the other one oversaw uh, our leadership professional development programs and uh, assessment center type of things. So they each had an individual, had a specialty, things that they oversaw. And who was the lieutenant over the um, defensive tactics training? Who At the time was a Lieutenant John Mercil. Sorry? Um, lieutenant Johnny Mercil. What happens during uh, pre-service training now? So pre-service is our police academies. Uh, we have two different types of police academies, a recruit and a cadet program. So they will, um, currently it's changed a little bit since last year, but the time I was a commander, it was 18 and 19 week police academy that they would go through, that they had to pass before they could enter into their field training officer program. So they endure a lot of uh, use of force and defensive tactics. Uh, they train on investigations. They do scenarios, uh, de-escalation, crisis intervention, um, medical, and heavy emphasis on the policy manual and patrol operations. Okay. And <clears throat> the training that's provided, let's say for example, with defensive tactics, uh, is that different in, in pre-service than the training that's provided during in-service training? It, it's not different, it's just longer, they get more of it in the academy. If, if you, one moment, Your Honor, if I may. Thank you, Your Honor. Right, and, and so fair to say that the, the training that's offered up at the academy, it's just an extended version, a more thorough version of what's offered at in-service. Correct. In-service would focus more on classroom training, and there's a curriculum that's been developed by the defensive tactics instructors and teams, is that right? Yes. They typically show some kind of a PowerPoint presentation going over the rules um, and uh, Minneapolis Police Departmental Policy, is that right? Correct. For, for in-service, whereas the academy, they're gonna go through that same, uh, you know, some of the same concepts and materials, but in a more extended way. Yes. Right? Now, you've also mentioned um, a field training uh, program, and in order to have the field training program work, you have field training officers, is that right? Correct. And sometimes, uh, I'm sorry, the, the field training officers uh, need to be aware of what the people in pre-service are doing as far as what they're learning in defensive tactics, is that right? Yes. And so is it true that sometimes field training officers 
will receive instruction in defensive tactics, for example, uh, just the same as someone in pre-service training. Correct. And what is the purpose of making sure that the field training officers are uh, aware of what the training is in pre-service? So there's consistency of how we grade and how we evaluate uh, recruit officers on the street. And was the defendant a field training officer? He was. Do you know how long he was a field training officer? I do not know off the top of my head. And did you select him as a field training officer? I did. Now, uh, you've mentioned a variety of different courses that are taken and training that's provided at the Workforce Center. Uh, is it important to keep records of that training? It's very important. And why is that? Uh, because Minnesota Post Board, which is our Peace Officer Standards and Training, require us to complete so much training each year. Um, part of that is the 48 hours of continuing education over the course of three years. And with that training has to be uh, annual use of force, uh, weapons qualifications, mental health crises, procedural justice. So a third of that training, 16 hours roughly out of that 48 hours has to be um, in compliance with the Minnesota Post Board. And so keeping those records are you know, critical to make sure we can, when we bring them to Post Board, they can do an audit on them. And you rely on those records in order to, in fact, uh, make these reportings to uh, the post boards that you have qualified officers on your staff, is that right? Correct. They're kept in the ordinary course of uh, um, your business, I guess, in the, in the police department? They are. This time I'd like to show uh, the witness only, Exhibit 203 for identification. All right, Inspector, can you take a look at Exhibit 203 and I'll ask you to rotate through some of the pages so the witness can examine. You familiar with these records? I am. How are you familiar with them? So these are training records that we track in our workforce director system. Uh, we maintain these records. Uh, each officer has to sign in at training, usually in the morning and the afternoon. And then our civilian coordinator will upload these into the officer's file so we can keep track of the training or if somebody didn't make the training, who needs to make it up. And it's in-service training and any additional training that they had on duty. And I'd like you to go to the back page to show the last page of the witness. Right, and you see that this particular workforce record goes back uh, to 2003. Uh, why is that? And that's when workforce director started, I believe. Prior to that, there was some different system? This paper, paper system. Paper system. And how long are those records retained? So in workforce director or in our... How long does MPD retain the training records pre-workforce director? So the city retains records for seven years. So once we have them, We'll keep this in our workforce director. Some training syllabuses and itineraries are put on an M drive. Um, paper copies are generally archived at some point. They're brought down to a central location within the city. But for seven years? Correct. Okay. So these are the records that we have available for this particular individual going back to 2003. Is that yes. right? Okay. Uh, I'll offer, a, I'm sorry, is exhibit uh, 203 uh, the defendant's training records? Exhibit 203, is this the def yes. the, the training records of the defendant? Yes, it is. Uh, I'll offer Exhibit 203. Any objection? No objection. 203 is received. Uh, permission to publish. Yeah. And so I'd like to just, if you could uh, scroll up and highlight this first, uh, first record entry here. You can see these records are, are organized uh, in a way that this, generally labels the, the course and it gives uh, various dates and then there's a start date and an end date for the participant, is that right? Correct. And then a total number of continuing education credits that are, that are logged, is that right? Yes. Okay. Now I wanna back up through these records, if you could bring it out again. If you could 
slide down, please. Okay. All right, so uh, just for example, we can take a look at uh, what's labeled here in the 2019 annual training, that section there. All right, and so you see with these records, it's listed as a 2019 annual in-service training, and it refers to a phase three. Right. What is the annual in-service training? So our annual in-service training usually consists of three phases of training. The first phase will have uh, two days of in-service training for officers, so uh, approximately 14 to 16 hours uh, from January to roughly April. And then phase two, we'll roll into uh, our shotgun qualifications or medical training, um, depending on the curriculum that year, what's in that. And that's usually kind of the beginning of the summer months and the end of the summer months. And then phase three is our fall in-service training. And the same thing, it's usually two days of different curriculum that we have to, that we're mandated to do or that maybe the chief wants us to do or that we're trying to do professional development courses. And so regardless of the specific trainer, if, uh, if an individual from MPD is taking phase three 2019 annual in-service training, should they be learning the same thing on that particular day as anyone else in MPD taking phase three training? Yes, they should. If you could zoom out again, go down to 2018 FTO, next page. Oops. Okay, here you see what's marked as a 2018 FTO training program. FTO is field training officer, correct? Yes. And so is this a, a train the trainer program? Yes, from the FTO coordinator and uh, myself as a, the FTO lieutenant at the time put on that training where we brought in a variety of different instructors to teach at that class. And what is taught at, uh, at FTO training? So that was a, a almost 40 hour course and we taught, it was a primary emphasis on leadership, uh, the critical decision making model, um, effective rope, or it's a recruit observation, um, performance evaluation report really. Um, so the FTOs are taught the FTO manual and then they're giving tips on adult, train the adult uh, learner and we do some scenarios in there where they debrief using the critical decision-making model they had defensive tactics they had a component of human resources that came in to explain what the do's and other jobs are as a field training officer it's basically we were trying to make sure that they understood what the recruits are being taught because they're going to evaluate them out there and they're the closest thing to a supervisor that that re young recruit officer has <clears throat> and if uh, I understand your understood your prior testimony, uh, defensive tactics and use of force is something that's trained every year uh, during the regular in-service, is that right? Correct. So, for example, in 2018, the defendant would have uh, been instructed in defensive tactics and proper use of force at least twice, right? Once during this 2018 FTO training program and once during the regular in-service. Correct. And uh, if we can, uh, I'd like to at this time, just to the witness, display exhibit 275. And exhibit 275, does that appear to be a, a handwritten records, like a sign-in roster for a particular course? It is. The particular course includes patrol ops, and there's a parenthesis as taught in the academy and defensive tactics as taught in the academy. Is that right? Correct. In the uh, second name uh, on this list, does that appear to be the name of the defendant? It is. Right, and so does exhibit uh, 275 indicate that the defendant um, did receive on uh, November 30, 2018, a block of defensive tactics training as taught in the academy. Yes. 
Offer exhibit 275. Invision. No objection. 275 is received. Permission to publish. And if you could highlight this portion. And you can see the number of training hours here was eight, is that right? Correct. And so that would have been between, divided between patrol ops and defensive tactics as taught in the academy. Yes. And again, the purpose is so that a person can be an effective field training officer and know what the trainees or the uh, cadets and recruits are being taught in pre-service. Is that right? Yes. We could go back then to 203. She'll go to the uh, second page, page two of seven. And where it says 2018, uh, this one. If you could highlight that, please. Oh. It's up for me. Uh, is it just quit? Or you want to publish? Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Permission to publish. You highlight that section, please. And, and just to define some terms here, you see uh, it says 2018 shotgun and CIT training. Is that right? Yes. And it's a seven hour block. Yes. Correct. And CIT, what does that stand for? That is uh, crisis intervention training. So de-escalation and mental health awareness. You also see there's a training uh, indicated for uh, procedural justice and Narcan training in 2018, correct? Yes. And on the uh, uh, crisis intervention training, uh, this one is a fairly short crisis intervention training block, is that right? Correct, they, they switched days. So one group would go to uh, qualify with shotguns and the other group would be in CIT and they'd flip-flop after lunch. But the, but the original crisis intervention training um, block or model that's taught to uh, MPD officers, it's much longer than seven hours or even splitting seven hours, is that right? Yes, it's 40 hours and this is just a refresher. Okay, and so then if you could um, move to the next page, please. And highlight that portion. Uh, the one above it too, where it starts at CIT 2016. All right, and so here you see on the defendant's training records, it indicates uh, multiple eight hour blocks of instruction occurring in November of 2016, is that right? Yes. And is that a show where the defendant uh, attended paid crisis intervention training in 2016, the, the approximate 40 hour course? It does. In addition to, if you can take that down please, in, in addition to the um, defensive tactics and use of force training, uh, does in-service training require regular medical or you know, combat lifesaver training? Yes, we generally do a medical component. Okay. Can you just please describe what that training entails? Sure, so our medical support team uh, consists of a full-time trainer and they have part-time trainers that are certified EMTs or paramedics. They're also police officers. So they will perform, uh, they'll conduct CPR training, Narcan, tourniquet, chest seals, um, and just life-saving measures, position, the, the cover positional asphyxia, um, sometimes they cover excited delirium, opioids, um, things that relate to our job when we respond to a call so they can better assess the situation when they get there and be able to render first aid. Now, you mentioned the term positional asphyxia. You're familiar with what that is? Yes. What is your understanding of positional asphyxia? 
So positional asphyxia is if you're in a position where you're, you're not able to adequately breathe. Something is interfering with your airway. And if an individual is in a prone handcuffed position, for example, face down, that could inhibit their ability to breathe. Yes. And cause positional asphyxia. Yes. And what are officers trained to do or supposed to do to prevent positional asphyxia? They're supposed to uh, put them on the side recovery position, which is they're going from prone and just putting them on their side or upright position. How soon are they supposed to do that prior to or after getting the person under control in the prone position? As soon as is possible. How long uh, have you known about the potential dangers of positional asphyxia? Uh, we were taught positional asphyxia all the way back to my academy. At the uh, Minneapolis Police Department? Yes. Uh, have the dangers of positional asphyxia been known throughout the department at least as long as you've been employed there? Correct. And your employment overlaps you know, with the defendants, is that correct? Yes. As part of the medical training, do you, uh, in addition to the uh, actual how-to of, of providing emergency medical care, are uh, officers taught their obligations to provide and render emergency assistance when the circumstances arise? Yes, it's in policy as well as training. You're familiar with the Minneapolis um, critical decision-making model? I am. And that model, you've seen the circle, we've all seen the circle now a few times, that uh, model is infused throughout different portions of the training materials at MPD, is that right? It is. Why is that? <clears throat> we wanted to ensure the officers, a lot of experienced officers understand that critical decision-making model. The more experience you have, the more you can walk through it. Uh, but we found it critical that recruits learn it early on. It was helping them uh, connect the dots better with information they were receiving on the scene and working through that, that wheel, uh, constantly reassessing, and then using the pillars of procedural justice in the middle. And so we wanted it consistent with our field training officer program to debrief them, the recruits, and then and our in-service so that officers out there could constantly reassess situations when they're on a scene. You said that um, the critical decision-making model was used to reassess uh, people who are going through the FTO process? Yes, in the field training officer program, we had scenarios where we had the field training officer debrief. Uh, at the time, we used community service officers as role players, so we had them debrief using that after, after a scenario. So going through the steps of taking in information, assessing risk, assessing threats, reassessing, evaluating goals, um, and then relating that to the pillars of procedural justice, that's something that any field training officer would be required to do with uh, the people that they're evaluating, correct? Correct. In your defensive uh, tactics uh, training, you are uh, not only showing or having uh, officers learn you know, sort of the nuts and bolts of defensive tactics, but also the rules of engagement, is that right? Correct. And those are contained in the Minneapolis <clears throat> Police Departmental Policies, is that right? Yes. And the rules are the rules, they apply to everyone. They apply to you. Yes. They apply to um, recruits. They apply to cadets. They apply to people on field training and experienced officers as well, is that right? Correct. Uh, I'd like to show you uh, what's been received as Exhibit 17. Uh, I need to ask you, officer, as you look at Exhibit 17, is this a trained technique that's uh, by the Minneapolis Police Department when you were uh, overseeing the training unit? It is not. Okay, why not? Uh, well, use of force according to policy has to be you know, consistent with MPD training. And what we train are neck restraints, the conscious and unconscious neck restraint. So per policy, uh, a neck restraint is compressing one or both sides of the neck using an arm or leg. But what we train is using uh, one arm or two arm to do a, a neck restraint. 
And how does this differ? I don't know what kind of improvised position that is. So that's not what we train. All right. Yeah. You can take that down. Thank you. I have no further questions. You may have. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, just want a few follow-up questions. In terms of any in-service, you see when we look at the exhibit, you see 2020 defensive tactics in-service, and it's worth eight hours of time. Agreed? Correct. Now, in that course of that eight hours, officers may go through multiple trainings during that eight-hour time, right? Correct. They rotate through things. I'm sorry? They can rotate through different... Right. So one, one, uh, in, within that eight hour time frame, they may get a class or an hour long class on say the human factors of force, or they may get a, an hour long course on handcuffing techniques. It varies within each of those eight hour time frames, right? Correct. Now, have you maintained a list that shows, uh, 2020, uh, these are the classes that occurred during those eight hours? We have. Okay. And have you provided that list to, uh, in response to the search warrant that was uh, 
executed at the police department? Yes. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, the defensive t training tactics or any of these continuing education classes, the, there are other officers that actually train these classes, and multiple officers may uh, appear during that eight-hour time, multiple trainers, right? Yes, we have part-time trainers. So there would be maybe one person will teach the, again, the human factors of force, someone else may train uh, on crisis intervention, and there'll be multiple instructors, right? Correct. But a lot of the instructors will use materials from past instructors, or they'll take combinations of things, and they'll just represent it in a slightly different format, right? At times, yes. Right. And I just, uh, for the record, I want to um, ask you, you were served, or the Minneapolis Police Department was served with a search warrant requesting all of the training materials uh, for the uh, four involved officers in this case, right? Correct. And so this would be materials that were from, some materials that were from the police academy, some materials that were from uh, in-service, just a variety of different uh, records, right? Correct. Um, some 30,000 pages, perhaps? Thousands, yeah. Okay. I have no further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Right. Thank you, Inspector. You may be excused. Members of the jury, we're going to take our break for the day. Uh, we have a hearing. We have to do at 8.30, but I'm still hoping that we can get started by 9.15, so same arrangement as today. Thank you. Have a, just a reminder, don't talk to anybody about the case. Don't read it in the media. Appreciate your patience. Thank you.